happening, lots of meeting new people, lots of understanding in depth, many different topics. First up today, we have someone very exciting joining me for a conversation. We have Chani Dundia. Who heading, who's heading wines at Pernod Ricard India. She comes with a broad experience in brand management, strategic marketing and product development and has worked in other places and other markets, including greater China, Southeast Asia, and of course the Indian subcontinent. She has previously also been the senior brand manager for Dom Perignon, Moe Hennessy and Diageo in Hong Kong. So I can't wait to have this chat with Chani Dunia. Hello, Johnny. Hi, Sonil. How Hi, you? how are you? It's such a pleasure and thank you for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. It's such a pleasure. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Excellent. Listen, this is going to be lots of fun. I, uh, you know, we're talking about consumer tastes. We're talking about uh, consumer palates, what do they enjoy in their wines. We're going to talk about our personal experiences, what we feel are the wines that really click with the audiences. And of course, draw upon some of the best case examples of, of very successful brands that you run in your very own portfolio of Pernod Ricard. So let me dive at the deep end of the ocean and start off with asking you the question that I've always wanted to ask personally. How does Jacob's Creek get to be such a successful brand i mean not only is it the leading imported brand that is consumed in india but jacob's creek has amassed so much popularity and love and 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 accolades across the world in every market where it's been i want to know what is the magic recipe how does one create a brand that is globally recognizable not just from a marketing aspect but also from a taste aspect what's your thoughts what are your personal thoughts on that so, Sonal, you're right. Now, this is a brand that is now in 83 markets around the world. It is known as the credible Australian brand. I mean, Australian wine bread, but an Australian brand. So it's sort of become a symbol of Australia in many, many ways. I think one aspect of it, it has been which clicked across the globe is consistency, the quality, and the fact that it has is accessible in many, many ways, accessible as a wine, accessible from the consumer point of view. Like you said, everybody would have had a Jacob's Creek in their wine journey, right? Or people are discovering it. So it's 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 a wine that everybody says is comfortable with. I think that's that, that has been a very important factor. So right. if you are sitting with a group of friends, you wouldn't argue you know, yeah. with wine. I mean, it's something that you would go pick up what has also helped the brand is innovation as the consumer change, the dynamics change each market. What is beautiful is in our portfolio, there's something which suits the palate in each market. And there are some universal, whether it's a Chardonnay, Shiraz Cabernet or Cabernet Sauvignon, which is one of the highest selling um, grape varieties. Uh, some, it sort of sits with everybody. So there's never, it's not, it's not trying to be very edgy. It's only trying to be very comfortable and reliable and has had consistent quality. I think that has really helped the brand over the years. And we are yeah. so glad to see the love we get across the world. And, in and you know, uh, pro uh, contrary to what a lot of people may think, uh, because most people look at Jacob's Creek as a brand that caters to the early drinker, particularly the, the, the entry level range. But what a lot of people miss and don't get or may not be aware of, and perhaps this might be a good forum to share, is Jacob's Creek also creates a reserve range and many other exciting variants under the same brand portfolio, which caters to, you know, which is a more complex style and perhaps caters to a more evolved palette. And I want to talk about all these words, which is what does accessibility mean? What does evolved mean? You know, because I think, it's important to decipher that in, in technique, I mean, like taste terms, but we'll come to that. But I want to first ask you about what are the various variants that would cater to different audiences that fall under Jacob's Creek? So we have what everybody sees in India, the classic line, which is the starting line. We have, uh, we innovate a lot. And so we've recently launched some uh, a line which is double barrel. Whiskey cast age twice age in the line, which is reserve line and above. I mean, we do. We also have a brand called Saint Hugo, 
Now, the, this really comes from Barossa. These are aged, evolved wines where a lot of expertise, wine making expertise has gone in. Mm. Uh, so as I was saying in the beginning, there's something, we have sparkling. I mean, we are very few, one of the few wine companies who does a very successful sparkling in the category. There's a rosé, there's a Moscato. As we go up for an evolved consumer, uh, there is pure by the winemaker. There's limited edition, which is only available with the winemaking, uh, you know, the expertise of a winemaker or what he wants to launch. Uh, there's Barossa Signature, which is at a higher end. And that talks about single vineyards, wine coming from specific, as we said, evolved consumer, which looks for a you know full palate, yes. something that talking to them. Every sip you explore something, every time when you're tasting it, something else hits you that, oh wow, this is this is what I get. So there's a full range, and that's what I was trying to say. It's a brand that caters to sort of the uh, as we call the pyramid, the consumer pyramid, yes, and, and the consumer journey. So the journey. Yes your wine journey where you are either your exploratory journey or you want trying something to something that you're more evolved in you know and there's always this question about new world can new world do a very evolved or in a wine that that deserves the rating or deserves that um, that effort and yes new world does it australia does it and jacob street does it definitely Yes. I mean, look, I, I, I'm proud to say this, that when I had just stepped in into the wine world and I was very early in my journey, um, and I think I was just, uh, I hadn't even started studying, actually. I was probably just tossing a few nice glasses of wine at the time and enjoying them. Uh, but one of my early drinks, not the first, but one of the early glasses of wines I had had was a Jacob's Creek. And I remember, um, you know, really enjoying it. Uh, I mean, I still do, don't get me wrong. But I, even as an early drinker, I remember being, you know, very happy with how it tasted. Um, I thought it was, again, you know, the word you use, accessible. I thought it was really accessible, delicious, enjoyable. And I had the Chardonnay, the, you know, the white. I thought it was really refreshing. Uh, and yet there was something wonderful about it, you know. So I, I often... Uh, like to say to people that you know if you're if you're early in the wine see the thing the thing the point I want to make is you know a lot of people start their wine journey the wrong way if you've started it the wrong way if you've started it with a bad glass of wine and what I mean by a bad glass is a wine that's compromised that's not been stored properly or it's just not well made you know it it, it just has some kind of a taint in its taste chances are you might take your first sip and say oh my god I don't even like wines I don't know why what the who who Baloo is about, like, you know, and I find that if you go with something as reliable as a Jacob's Creek or some other such recognizable or very established brand around the world, then at least you start off with the right footing. And thereafter, of course, then, you know, we all know that the world of wine is a world of discovery. So you're supposed to try different styles and sort of move on from there. But I just thought I'd share, by the way, what's in your glass today? What are you drinking? So I am today actually drinking not Jacob's Creek, but one of my recent in my portfolio, a Campo Viejo from Spain. Now right. I've, and this is very recent discovery, I'll be honest, Spanish wines. I, I've been more into Australian old world wines, but Spain Tempriano, this has become one of my favorites right now. Nowadays with evening meal at home, it's and Tempriano. I mean, the Rioja grape, the Rioja grape that we talk about. So we see Campo Viejo everywhere. It's virtually on every wine list in every restaurant, bar. So tell us more about what makes Campo Viejo such a huge success around the world and now increasingly in India too. So this is another one. So it's one of the biggest brands out of Rioja. It is the only carbon neutral winery actually awarded uh, since 2000. Uh, so it's uh, headed by three women. So the wine making team is all women. With the very with, with the with the focus that we respect our land, we want to preserve our land. So they are working on tradition, uh, modern versions, keeping the uh, modern techniques, keeping the tradition alive. Yeah. What we have is the Tempranos, so which is known, you know, Riojoja, Tempriano, the grape varietal from that region. And what it makes is interesting is again that it's focused on the grape varietal or what that land gives us. Right. And what the land is known for, which is this this beautiful Tempriano grape, and a versatile again, it's such a versatile drink, a uh, variety, right? And I I've been pairing it with almost everything at home with a Punjab. I'm a Punjabi, so with Punjabi food, 
and literally having it over, you know, or just when I'm winding down. So besides uh, Jacob's Creek, this is another one that I've been really, really enjoying. And this is uh, what uh, around a one year discovery now, one, one and a half year discovery for me. Amazing. Listen, I want to talk more about the Tempranillo grape and the style and the structure of this grape variety and why we both believe that it's it might be one of the grape varieties that might be the future in India. But before we get to that, I, I want to touch upon this word we used a lot in our conversation, which is this is enjoyable, this is accessible, this is easy drinking. You know, we often sort of use these words when we describe our wines to make ourselves better understood. But the truth is, I want to actually try and for our audiences today, try and say structurally, what do we exactly mean? What does it mean for a wine to be easy drinking or accessible? Are we saying the wine needs to be sweet? Are we saying the wine needs to, how do you describe accessibility in wine? So for me, a wine is accessible when I know I am drinking it by itself and enjoying it. And I have the flexibility uh, of being able to pair it with anything that I'm having. Mm -hmm. Now, um, so I spent a lot of time in Northern Asia, uh, with China, uh, in Hong Kong, in China, in Japan. So for me, a wine uh, for me a wine experience is a versatile experience. Right. I, so every time I take a sip of it, if I'm having a dumpling or a sushi or even a rajma chawal at home, is my wine interfering with my food? Or is this something that I'm enjoying equally? But to me, that is what accessibility means in my words. And the other aspect is it's it's a quality that I fall back upon. So is it something that I can just blindly go pick up in a, a wine shop and come back and say, okay, okay, this is what I'm drinking today because I'm happy with it. That makes it enjoyable for me and accessible for me. I love, I love that definition. Uh, I'm going to have a go at what I think accessible means to me. So I love the word about compatibility. I agree with you. I also look for that compatibility where a wine doesn't interfere too much with the food or with any, or even on its own, you know, what I look for is the good balance. I think a, a well-balanced wine has a little bit of everything. It's got a lot of fruit going on. There's, there's, you know, the tannins are not in the way. The acid is not too high, not too low. It's kind of just right. So structurally, all the components sit in perfect harmony. And overall, the wine is incredibly uh, harmonious enjoy, and, and easy drink, you know, it kind of goes down very nicely, uh, which leads me to the second word, which is it needs to be smooth. I think when I speak to a lot of um, consumers and I say, how do you ask for your wines? How do you like your wines to be? I often hear the word smooth a lot. You know, consumers are often looking for wines that go down nicely, you know, just go down smoothly and sort of don't have any jarring moments, you know, like the acidity is not too high or it's not too dry on the, on the, in terms of astringent, not dry as in not sweet. Um, and of course, a little bit of sweetness also helps sometimes, isn't it? Just a little bit of a bump of sweetness or lots of fruit, lots of ripeness of fruit. Uh, it kind of helps make it uh, really enjoyable. Uh, so balanced, compatible, smooth. And most importantly for me is it should ask you, uh, it should leave you begging for more. Yeah, invite you to take another sip. And even after the experience is over, it should invite you to buy another bottle. Yeah. So I think what, what truly makes some brands like Jacob's Creek or, or Campo Greco or a couple of others very successful is it kind of is so reliably consistent that you feel, I know this taste, it's relatable. I've enjoyed it the first time and I know I can keep going back to it over and over again and enjoying it. Although I don't, I must admit, I don't always advocate remaining faithful to brands because, you know, the whole, the whole joy of wine, wine world is the discovery aspect. But I would definitely say for those who have never tried a Jacob's Creek or have never tried a Campo Vieco uh, or, or are looking for options which are, um, you know, just if you're having a large party, for example, and you want to pour something that is very compatible with food. I often also find, um, Chandni, what do you feel? But I feel a lot of the simple wines pair better with, uh, with foods. You know, you don't necessarily have to be hugely sort of complex, isn't it, to be... But there, you're right, because I find it sometimes that if I really have to, I'm going deeper into the food, you know, sometimes you do like your whole fine dining experience where each, every element or the flavor or the spice 
uh, that chef, the amount of love the chef puts in and goes with it. There, sometimes I find I would like to go with the Lafitte or maybe open a Petrus so or look for those old, heavy bodied, where you're swirling it and thinking about it while you're grabbing a bite around, you know, with the food. But most often they're not. I mean, I'm sure you get to, you are, uh, everybody asks you the same question that are you actually opening <laughs> an old aged cellar wine? Or is this something that you're opening which is accessible and you're happy with? For me, most often than not, I go back to that simpler wine because uh, so that I can be, I can do justice to both, to the food that I'm having and enjoying it and continue with it actually through the evening, through the lunch or where I am I'm at. Yeah, amazing. Um, let's touch upon what we've, okay, according to you, what are the grape varieties that people enjoy drinking today? And guys, if you all are listening in, please drop some comments on what is it that you enjoy drinking so we can keep reading your comments and, and taking some, some encouragement from that too. But according to you, Chandni, what, what are the grape varieties that you're seeing flying off uh, shelves or doing really well with consumers today? So here in India, I see a lot of consumers, uh, we tend to enjoy reds more, I mm -hmm. guess, because we like less acidity. Red cuts the, the spiciness and bit of oiliness that is there in our food as well. I am seeing a lot of Shiraz Cabernet. I am seeing a lot of Cabernet Sauvignon moving. Mm -hmm. I do, with the heat that is hitting North India where I am in, I would definitely enjoy a sparkling a Chardonnay Pinot Noir, a sparkling in summer. I think that that is a fantastic way to start your uh, you know, late evening and it pairs beautifully with your dinners as well. But I'm seeing a lot of focus on reds and I'm, I'm hoping to see that Indians start discovering a bit more uh, uh, whites, a Chardonnay, for example. Yeah. Um, you know, there is a, a lot of Chenin Blanc in the market, but then there's also these gorgeous Sauvignon Blancs that come out of this tiny, tiny New Zealand as a country, winemaking country. Um, so yeah, but uh, reds is what seems to be more uh, uh, compatible to the palate, I would say, which sort of inter interferes less with our food, less with all those, you know, spices whenever we take a bite of our food. Um, so that is the first go. Uh, but I would definitely like to see more whites coming in. Uh, yeah. you know. I mean, it, it's almost ironical why India doesn't drink enough whites, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> We're such a bloody hot country. Uh, if anything, we should be drinking more whites. And, and uh, but thankfully, we're seeing a big uptake for roses and sparklings. Yeah, uh, you know, in the particularly during the pandemic, while people were caged in at home, we saw a lot of sparkling wines and rosé wines flying off shelves. And I think it's to do mainly with the fact that people just wanted to be able to drink that was so something that was sort of light, didn't feel too warm or alcoholic on the palate. Although alcohol levels are the same, guys, I must clarify between a white, red, it's not it's not a determinant, but it's just that sometimes the perception of red wine can be heavier on the palate. And so technically when you're sipping on a white or a rosé or a sparkling, it, it feels lighter. Um, so yeah, so rosés are suddenly doing very well as they are globally you know there seems to be this massive rosé uh, revolution trend and even sparkling trend that has picked up yet again so uh, with jacobs creek we sell a sparkling here in india which is a combination of a chardonnay and pinot noir and what i love about sparkling is like as soon as it hits 40 degrees it sits in a fridge extremely fresh even a even a white a chardonnay and just goes very easily just very very easy to have and you know it's like but a lot of us have uh, lemonade and nimbu pani sometimes because you need to get that freshness. And if you think about whites, the lemon, the lime and the fruit that hits you, it's very similar. It is. Yeah. And uh, the trend of making cocktails with sparklings now, uh, yeah. sparkling, which has again picked up in India with the younger consumer. That's very interesting to see as well. I mean, with the gap yeah. that, are, uh, which is unique uh, for us with roses, with sparkling in India, I think people have started, that's the beauty of wine, that it's so versatile. Mm -hmm. So you go from a classic, you, go, you have roses, then uh, there is sparkling, and you, uh, there is always something to discover and enjoy and do, and something that you would make your own, like a personal experience. I think yeah. that's the beauty. I think with the sparkling category, I mean, you, you've touched upon an interesting point, but I sometimes feel new world sparkling wines may not be a very understood category in India. 
That's true. What is happening is this is a well established fact that other than Moet 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 de Chandor, obviously, and and of course the big the big giants. Champagne is not really enjoyed by the critical mass. The vast majority yes. of wine drinkers in India don't necessarily always enjoy champagne or the taste of champagne, and they're always looking for something that is easy drinking, more accessible, as you call it, more friendly, maybe something more fruit forward, basically in simple terms, not something too atolic or too complex. And I think. you know the a lot of our indians are reaching out for prosecco as a category or sometimes even an indian sparkling because they're of the wide available uh but i think there is a very prominent category of sparkling wines which is the new world sparklings as we call it which is sparkling yes. wines coming from australia like the jacobs creek uh, sparkling or even those coming from california i don't think we have any here in india yet but there's a whole lot of this new world sparkling category uh that's coming out of uh, all over the world that uh, people also need to explore you know and perhaps uh, uh do you find that uh, the sparkling jacobs creek is sort of uh in the shadow of the white and the red variant some the spark you uh, you rightly mentioned is something the category that he is yet to be explored to the level uh with the indian consumer now uh, what i find personally is the beauty of sparkling again like the classic varietals that we talked about earlier that it's very compatible and as soon as uh, and it it's not very for example jacobs creek is not very highly acidic it's tad bit sweeter i mean it's method champenoise of course but with the combination of the grapes that it has uh, that makes it very easy to drink so yeah. it's it's something which is yet to come yet to be explored a bit more much like whites in general in india but it's it's i mean people will be fascinated when they start discovering this whole new world sparklings that we are talking about exactly uh, and you know I, my experience in northern asia uh, taught me that a sparkling with asian food sits beautifully like a classic um mm-hmm. red or a classic white is so i one of my best best examples that i always quote is there's a dish called thousand year old egg in chinese food or a, uh, or a fish maw and you try a sparkling with it it's the best combination ever yeah. i mean sparkling yeah. wines pretty much pair with everything you know they just they cut through the fat really well they're very, they're very uplifting they're very energizing uh they pair with uh, light foods because they are light themselves they pair with heavy foods because they cut through the you know they cut That's through the heaviness the fattiness of the food so they kind of really very very compatible with a wide range of foods isn't it and what i like about a lot of new world sparklings and and uh, more fruit forward styles as opposed to champagne i mean of course i love champagne don't get me wrong but what i really like about the fruit forward styles is that they uh they don't compete with the foods they just sort of help complement in a nice yes. way they they're friendly you know with the food they don't try to compete with the food so sometimes you just want that because if you're enjoying something that you want to enjoy the taste of you don't want to alter the taste of the food either cuz let's face it sometimes most times for for a lot of indians the food is the hero you know exactly right yeah. the food is yeah. the hero like a lot of us indians you know when the food comes at the table we forget to even drink uh we, we just start eating and then we forget about the drink so uh the food is always the hero i always say so uh you know the wine just needs to be really friendly compatible and sort of slip into the experience therefore thereby taking it to the next level but in its own elegant subtle way you know not yeah. just in a loud way or in a way that is forced at all okay uh let's touch upon the original love of indians that is the red wines right red wine uh, yeah and you mentioned there's a lot of cabernet sauvignon up north is that is that what you're seeing flying no i'm there? seeing a lot of blues flying here in bombay there's a lot of cabernet yes there is shiraz i'm also seeing cab sauv uh, a cabernet sauvignon uh, which is interesting what i'm what i have not seen much and i mean uh, uh, don't get me wrong but pinot noir which is a very light varietal you know and that's again um, it's not something which really sort of gets into your food and your palate and that's something which is a beautiful variety new zealand is doing beautiful pinot noirs nowadays um this australia uh, as well and i think that is again something which would complement our lifestyle let's just say that um and can be easily had throughout right So that's so Pinot Noir that's is the love of my life. I cannot praise <laughs> Pinot Noirs enough because again, I think Pinot Noirs are just 
so by the way we had a master class yesterday where uh-huh. jim jim robertson uh, conducted a a master class on branker estate wines and really helped us understand in depth all about the new zealand terroir wine making and everything all seen through the eyes of branker estate and it's a really deeply engaging sort of a session went into a lot of detail we had a lot of our viewers write, writing to us saying can i have that presentation so obviously that presentation is worth its weight in gold where we are selves trying to get our hands on it So uh, it was a very engaging. But anyway, coming back to Pinot Noir, and I did a little bit of a tasting of the Sauvignon Blanc and Pinot Noir. I think what I love about the Pinot Noir the most is the fact that again, it's light enough to pair with you know your salmon and your chicken and your lighter foods and even paneer, guys, for the vegetarians. Yeah. But then it's complex enough because it really offers you those layers, right? It's not. It's it's. it's fruit forward but it's not never one layer there's always a bit of florality there's a little bit of the minerality there's a little bit of the savoriness there's a little bit of everything coming through on a pinot noir always um which is which makes it complex enough to pair with even red meats so it's yeah. a classic uh, uh you know it's it's brilliant at dispelling the myth of having to pair white white wines with white wines with red wines with red meat pinot noir is a great starting point to sort of dis- tell that myth and start enjoying a wide variety of foods with a wide variety of wine starting with the pinot noir i think and you're you're right i i i i'm frustrated that india has been somewhat late in catching on to the, the pinot noir craze don't you think yeah i mean i you know i have pinot noir with desserts sometimes <laughs> uh, you know just for to taste and and that's the thing it's such a it's such a beautiful variety that we have and i do hope i i really really looking forward so i've seen a lot of change that has happened in 10 years since i've I know, after a gap that i've come back to the country and i'm very excited i'm very excited for the next decade and as consumers are evolving in their journey more coming in you know and there's all these new varietals uh, that a lot of us are bringing in people who are in the business um to be to be discovered and as more and more what i and the you know diversity that we have in india with our cuisine with our lifestyles with our seasons seasonality it's such an ideal opportunity to be able to be discovering much more so like a pinot noir yes. or like sparkling um you know and yeah. enjoy it a bit more so for me it's an what experience you, what do you think are the great varieties of the future so oh, i i really there but yeah i really want to see pinot noir flourishing here I really would like to see the Sauvignon Blanc going forward. Um and uh, you know historically in India we've had Malbec. Yeah. It's medium bodied. Uh you know it's nice to have a uh, palate and the fruits that it has but I would like to see these more approachable wines that are coming in nowadays. Uh so Pinot Noir Sauvignon Blanc is something that I'm really looking forward to and sparkling definitely. So uh I want to share something interesting because Malbecs are are doing very well in India right now. Right. They are really enjoying and I think 8 out of 10 people I ask what do you enjoy in a red they tend to these days say Malbec you know. Um and of course Merlots have always done very well in India. Yes, so Merlot yeah. is by the way. But I remember when I was studying for my MW and we used to do blind tastings and we used to try and decipher the grape for ID and all that. For us the three laterals so what I mean by laterals is where you often confuse one for the other, right? Yes. Yeah. The, the trio was always Malbec, Merlot, and Tempranillo. Yeah. Oh wow! Yeah, because there are so many similarities structurally. Exactly. You know, they're all they're all sort of not high in acid. They're all sort of ripe fruit. They're all rounded, you know, good. when the Merlot is from the New World, it definitely is. They all yeah. kind of rounded as a result of that. So ripe, ripe fruit forward and low in uh, this. They all tend to uh, well, at least Merlot and Malbec can be slightly higher in alcohol. Correct. Tempranillo wins there because Tempranillo is actually never never high in alcohol it's just right because it comes from the region of Rioja that enjoys this fabulous mediterranean climate so it's always moderate and well balanced but there's just so many similarities structurally between them and i often say to people that guys if you enjoy a malbec or if you enjoy a merlot please give tempranillo a shot discover the joy of tempranillo because you know uh, it it's it's such a compatible variety and so much so that a lot of indian producers are also now planting tempranillo well i believe so it seems yeah. like i mean i have yet to taste one i'll be honest but i'm seeing that i'm seeing that it's quite interesting that if our climate is able to take that this grape will both you know it uh, i i personally really enjoy this 
and uh, this would be fantastic if we are able to do it uh, i i believe our climate is able to take it in uh, the two main uh, winery a uh, areas for us in uh, cultivation but yeah, you're absolutely right i remember i remember doing this tasting tasting during our trainings and you know just tasting through my journey um i in, initially into i uh, used to fall back on malbec a lot personally yeah. as well yeah. every time every time and that's what i would fall back on but as i progressed in my own journey in my own personal journey as i said and started discovering rioja tempranillo and other grape varieties or new zealand um and spain as i mentioned i i started leaning more towards these again because we said because of the balance because of the ease and sometimes again uh with the humid weather that i've been in for so many years now i would safely go back to tempranillo or to a pinot noir yeah. when people ask me how to describe spain or the taste of spain i always say to them that it's the new world of the old world yeah uh, you're absolutely right it hits home because you know a lot of wine drinkers they want to associate with old world wines yes prejudice there is a certain level of prejudice so if you're serving or you're gifting a bottle of wine or you're serving wine at home people want to be able to say it's from the old world country rather than a new world country you know um but then they want the fruit they want the fruit they want the ripeness they want the fruit forward and they want the wines to be enjoyable so when people ask me okay what should i do i said buy a spanish wine because you know it's the new world of the old world because spain is relatively hotter as compared to most parts it's of france, france. or most yeah. parts of uh, you know i mean italy is hot too but you know spain is the new world of the old world and so i say you you got to tick both the boxes if you buy something from spain and and serve it or whatever and so i like to often refer to my tempranillos as crowd pleasers because it's like it's it's like one size fits all kind of a totally you know it is and i mean spain with catalan and catalan food when spain was put on the map and you know of course with ferran adria el buri and all the restaurants that came about and then it came with this wine you're uh, exactly it's 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 something to be discovered i'm so happy that it's, i discovered it a year and a half back besides the food because uh, and you've hit the you've really said it that it really is something that if it's you know it ticks the boxes go for it old okay. world go for it okay but yeah so there's two other hard. demographics i want to talk about and what you think they might enjoy drinking one is women women are taking to wine in a big way in india and yes. it's a very very important demographic because you know chandni we know that half of india is women of course not all of them are drinking but the point is half of india are women and so if we have like 700 million women in this country then globally one out of 10 people walking this earth is an indian woman exactly 700 million are an exactly. indian women so you and me are part of one of those 10 people walking this earth you know what i mean that's uh, that to me is a very compelling statistic um what do you think women in india are drinking or will enjoy drinking what i mean a lot of what we talked about already but anything specific that you feel so i i'm so happy that you touched upon this because this is a consumer or women coming into the fold of wine is beautiful um you know uh, and what i'm seeing is they're again falling back because they are in some, a lot of them are in their journey starting mason journey and that's where they're uh, discovering it um we've always associated like a champagne or a sparkling like a you know a woman's drink per se because it's very feminine and not masculine you know this genderization that is happening yeah. within the world of wine but I'm, again i'm seeing like much like many indians uh, them drinking reds but then equally enjoying a sparkling yeah. or a cocktail yeah. i i'm noticing a lot of people in winters going towards a mulled wine a cocked a sangria but we can do afternoons of cocktails which are made out of sparkling again because it's easy for them to drink as they're discovering it uh what is the beauty again is that they're able to associate it uh, a simple red like a shiraz cabernet or a sparkling with the palate with the fruit that we have grown up with and uh, you know that's another aspect of accessibility of the wine that do i find what i am used to and not a, a westerner who is brought up with some Correct. of their own fruit you know yes now Correct. we have this thing but sometimes in our head growing up what we have seen a mango or a grape or a orange or something or a, you know a leaf a pudina uh, for that matter in greens or not a lime not a lemon so as soon as we associate with these and i've seen a lot of women have told me this that i go to a sparkling i go to a shiraz cabernet 
or to a merlet because i discovered my fruit or mm-hmm. you know what i have been brought up with and mm-hmm. that's why i'm comfortable with it wonderful yeah. wonderful and to end our discussion on a high note i'm going to ask you as a big global giant pono record is nothing less than a global giant in in wine spirits and a whole category of drinks uh, but how ready do you feel in india for the gen z because 20% of the global gen z population is in yes, india yeah. we're an incredibly young country we're the youngest country in the world and this is the next set of consumers that's slowly but steadily coming into the drinking window and are obviously experimenting with a whole range of drinks how ready do you believe we honestly as as a as an industry are we to lure the gen z into wine over other beverages so we do have we are ready and that's the most exciting part that as india to us there is so much there is so much opportunity with wine there is so much opportunity with the younger consumer uh, uh, generation z or women for that matter and with the portfolio or with the uh, variety with the brands that we have in general this is the starting point this is the journey and what excites me is the fact that they're ready to experiment they are not you know they are happy to be trying something and then falling back on it once they discover where they are and as in, uh, more people come to the fold they would find that as an industry we are bringing something new every year so where they started in the next year or the year next they will find something else and the discovery i think for us as an industry the onus is that we have to be uh, sort of more modern in that sense we yeah. should need to ensure that we are talking about sustainability after the pandemic you know yes. the brand that really could give back to the society respect the land and the beauty about the wine industry is that's what we are we are dependent on the land yeah. we and are gen z, and gen z really cares about social causes you know i i find my daughter being so much more conscientious about uh, wastage or recycling and she's often picking on me saying you're not supposed to be doing this mommy and you know but i can see that they are they they're really fascinated by uh, you know carbon footprint and organic and you know all of these things so i think it's also uh, you know we need to be ready in that sense too isn't it for the, for this for this population um, i love the fact that you touched upon the experimentation word i think the gen z is all about uh experimenting and trying new things and exploring for themselves what is it that they yeah. enjoy i don't think the gen z is one who's going to be told drink this because it's good i think they want to discover for themselves what they find amazing and so there's going to be a lot of experimentation and i often like to think that you know i love the example you said about the nimbu pani like at the end of the day it's so similar to drink a nice zingy white wine <laughs> a refreshing glass of nimbu pani i love that corollary similarly youth of india are drinking cocktails they're enjoying cocktails a lot they're enjoying craft beers you know craft beers microbreweries are such a rage and what is common to all of them is that they all offer a different taste each time right there's a sense of discovery there's a sense of experimentation it's not kind of you know the same thing again and again and wine offers the same level of discovery so it actually sits in that same bracket of exciting drinks where the taste is different every time i think what only thing that works against wine as opposed to craft beers or cocktails is we over intellectualize our subject correct right we make it intimidating we make it complicated and so the youth then says oh, okay let me just go try something that's easy and coming back to your original word which is accessible so at the end of the day how much do you agree that we need to simplify simplify and simplify i think you know that's the first thing we need to do as an industry we have to make it very simple saying okay enjoy it because you are enjoying it i'm i am not dictating why you should have it you know, that was that was yes that was that's an important part of our industry itself but if somebody says this is how i enjoy it please don't dictate that i have to have red meat because i don't enjoy it or this is what is not available i don't want it fine i mean that's why i say that it's such a beautiful experience because it's for, on you to discover and yeah. i think that's what we have to start doing more and somewhere in our conversations because as part of the industry as experts we tend to sometimes you know make it complicated when we speak about it yeah. so 
if we are able to connect and it's all across the world all across the industry and uh, you know across that if we are able to connect in simpler manner so that we don't uh, uh, we make it i go keep going back to it, like that word convenience accessibility is something important and when they when i say experiment it's it's you know this is one category which is transversal in many many ways and so, unique in its own way it has this heritage of coming from different origins there are varieties everything yet somewhere it's homogenous in in its own uh, you know it brings everything together and as long as people are happy i think that's that's what is important that we don't over dictate anything i think it's about time we okay. stop i'm going to raise a glass to that and i'm and going to bring to your three words which is let's make wine convenient accessible and i'm going to add one which is enjoyable enjoyable you know let's make it enjoyable uh chandni this has been such a sparkling conversation um it's been thrilling speaking with you and thank you for sharing all those wonderful insights with us i'm very excited i am enjoying let me show the the bottle before i head out uh the double barrel double barrel the mirror right? image on the camera but i recently also made a video check it out on my youtube channel i did a review of the jacobs creek double barrel chiraz i thought it was a very interesting wine so uh, i'm enjoying sipping on it even now tani i will see you very soon thank you so much for today thank you so much thank you everybody who was part of the conversation and thank you for having me it was lovely pleasure thank you see you soon thank you bye bye For the part-time bonsai artist who's a full-time investment banker. Here's a piece of art that happens to be a decanter. Introducing the hosting collection by Shaze. Shine by design. for the part-time bonsai artist. for the part-time bonsai artist who's a full-time investment banker here's a piece of art that happens to be a decanter introducing the hosting collection by Shaze shine by design for the part-time bonsai artist who's a full-time investment banker here's a piece of art that happens to be a decanter 
Introducing the hosting collection by Shaze. Shine. For the part-time bonsai artist, who's a full-time investment banker, here's a piece of art that happens to be a decanter. Introducing the hosting collection by Shaze.
of CEO who likes to put on a show. Here's a showstopper. That happens to be a decanter. Introducing the hosting collection by Shaze. Shine by design.
guys. Welcome back to yet another lively session. And this one's real top notch. We're going to be talking about fine wine as an investment. Sorry, we had to take a little bit of a break because we had a little bit of time between the two sessions, but we're back. And we have with us a very, very exciting guest. His name is David Jackson. Uh, David, allow me to do a quick introduction. David is, well, he qualified as a chartered surveyor back in the late 80s and he worked in real estate until uh, 1995, at which point he qualified as a stockbroker. And thereafter, he's a stockbroker turned into a fine wine investment advisor sometime around 2000. In 2009, he established a company called Amphora Portfolio Management, which is a bespoke wine investment business advising private investors. Under David's guidance, Amphora Portfolio Management has become one of the most respected and innovative wine investment businesses in the market. So thank you so very much and welcome to the Sonal Holland Wine Academy Knowledge Summit, David. Oh, thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. And very good evening, everybody watching. Thank you. Okay, so David, here's what we're going to do. We're going to assume nothing. We want to learn from you because I still believe that the wine investment, fine wine investment concept and idea is still at a very nascent stage in India. And we have a lot of people watching us right now, which is a mix of all you know, all genres of people from the very, you know, people who love their wines to hospitality, um, you know, professionals, all kinds of people from the trade. So we're going to start from the absolute basic question, which is what is the concept of fine wine investment? Ah, it's a good question. The right question to start with. Okay. So in order to, uh, to understand what we're talking about, we should probably qualify what wines we're talking about here, because when one's investing in uh, in the wonderful world of wine, specifically you'll be in investing in fine wines. Um, and this is quite important actually for a number of reasons, because fine wine um, has a number of uniquenesses actually compared to pretty much any other luxury asset. So we need to sort of define what we're talking about with fine wine. And of course, you know, I think for people who are novices to wine, it might be a bit of a sort of scary phrase almost, but I promise you there's nothing to be afraid of with fine wine. It's very, very simple. Um, fine wine is wine that will mature with time in the bottle. It will improve with age in the bottle. Now, most of the wine that you buy these days, the stuff that you buy from the supermarkets, um, it won't do that. It's a prime, optimal um, drinking conditions when it goes into the bottle and you want to drink it within a year or two. But as you go up the scale of fine wine into the more glamorous and the more expensive wines, you'll find that they have a longer and longer and longer lifespan. Um, and when you get to the very top of the pile in the sort of wines that you that we trade in at Amphora and that you might want to invest in, um, you've got an incredibly long lifespan of certainly sort of 30 years and stored well. Um, you know, you might go up to even 100 years. It's possible. I've drunk 100-year-old wines in actual fact. Um, now, why is this important? I'll tell you why it's important. The, the fundamentals of investing in wine are actually pretty straightforward and pretty easy to grasp. Um, if you think about the way that wine is produced, you've got all these vineyards all around the world, and they are, um, of course, they're a parcel of land. Now, what that means is that uh, the wine producers are limited to the amount of grapes that they can grow by the geography of that land, and indeed, in some places, by the laws. You know, in in uh, places like Bordeaux and Burgundy, there are laws which will restrict the way that wines are made. But anyway, regardless of that, you can't make more grapes than you can produce on your land. So if you've got a very fancy um, winery um, making very expensive wines, there's only so much you can ever produce in any given year. Um, really unusual. You know, if you, if you think about that in the luxury good world, that's incredibly unusual because um, if you make fancy watches or fancy handbags, you can increase or decrease production depending on demand. But with wine, you can You make 15,000 cases this year, you're going to make 15,000 cases next year, you're going to make 15,000 cases the yeah. year after that. Okay, so we've got this fine wine product and it's produced in finite quantities. There's only so much going to be produced each year. Um, now, this gives us the bedrock of the investment market because what you have here is you've got instant scarcity. Um, and um, you can couple that with um, the fact that over the course of time, 
that's going to reduce. That actual supply to market is going to reduce. Why? Well, pretty obvious why, isn't it? People are going to be putting the corks out of these bottles. So you start out with a very small amount of wine. You have immediate scarcity, great desirability because we're in the fine wine, we're in the luxury space. And then over time, we have diminishing supply to market. Now, where supply is static or diminishing and demand remains the same, you will have upward pressure on the prices. If demand increases at the same time, then you're going to have extreme upward pressure on the prices. And some of the stuff that we'll talk about later on in this session is why demand is increasing on, on, on a global basis. But there are the nuts and bolts of it, right? A really rare product that's under high demand and gets rarer and rarer over time and therefore increases in value over time. Amazing answer. And I'm so glad because you touched upon so many. I was actually making notes and saying, I must ask about this, I must ask about this. <laughs> Uh, no, brilliantly answered. Thank you for that, David. What I do want uh, you to share a bit more about this with us is, and I get a lot of people asking me this, is it a new concept? Is it something that has just been discovered? I'd like you to tell us how this is something that has been happening in the developed markets and the matured markets like the US and across Europe for many, many many years now when people have perhaps draw some examples of how people have actually made money traditionally out of this is an alternative investment. Yeah, well, it's, I mean, it's a really interesting um, thought, actually, because the market has changed beyond recognition in just the last two decades. Now, the, the, the answer as to how long this has been going on for is pretty much as long as wine has been, not, not as wine has been made, but pretty much as, as far back as wine has been commercially traded. And the the history of it is really, it was sort of the, you know, once upon a time, it was just really the, you know, the, English and the French that were drinking these fine wines and the landed gentry who could afford this stuff would buy more than they needed and uh, wait for it all to double in value, drink their bit for free and sell the rest to the poor people further down the line who uh, who had to pay top dollar for it. So there has been a sort of uh, a sort of very primitive wine investment market um, taking place for quite literally hundreds of years. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating when I say that. Yeah. Now, that's not really to say that there's been a mature um, investment marketplace with any sort of structure for that amount of time. And even my sort of relatively short tenure um, in, in wine compared to those several hundred years, um, there have been some remarkable changes. I mean, my, my, my sort of the, the reason I came into this marketplace is that, and this is the same for the colleagues in my business, is that I was really an accidental wine investor. I was buying all of this stuff when I was a, a stockbroker and buying, you know, more stuff than I was ever likely to drink and more expensive than I should have been buying, but I loved it, you know, it was my joy and it was my passion. And then over time, what I found was that these wines were going up in value and the merchants that I bought it from were, were buying the stuff back from, you know, giving me a profit. Yeah. And so I was thinking, hang on, you know, what's what's going on here? This is this has got, I'm curious, this has got my attention because, um, you know, I love wine, it's my thing. I, I, I understand the investment process um, and I really want to understand what's going on here. Uh, I was so curious. And so I spent the longest time trying to understand the marketplace and trying to uh, answer the question that you've asked me, which is whether there is um, a, a, a structured and developed marketplace. And the conclusion I came to was there was not. And my observation was that the, the wine investment market was managed by good old-fashioned wine merchants who were all lovely men and women who know everything you could ever want to know about wine and a little bit more, but they don't know anything about investments. And they were trying to give people advice to the best of their, um, you know, in good faith and to the best of their knowledge. But um, my um, observation was that this was a little bit poor on the going inside and hopeless on the coming outside. What I mean by that is when people wanted to sell their wine and reap a profit, it was a sort of one person relationship. Um, and this is what tempted me really to launch Amphora because I thought, hang on, you know, my network, myself and the guys that I know, we must be able to apply our knowledge and help people make better decisions and get a bit of a better result out of their wine investing. So we, we, we came together with a view to doing just that. And we found some really sort of uh, unique things that I think we yeah. still do that um, I don't think anyone else in the marketplace does. But but throughout that time, there have been some real innovations. There's um, probably the most 
groundbreaking or, or market changing is a business called LiveX, which uh, is an online trading platform. It's a little bit like a it's a little bit like a stock market for wine. Yeah. It's not a true stock market because you don't. But I but I find the the, li- the fact that there is a LiveX and that there you know I find that the fact that it's slightly more regulated than so many other alternative investments like uh, like art, for example. You know we pay top dollars for our art sometimes and it's not regulated. It's like the seller's price. You know, the seller says, this is how much I'm selling it for, take it or leave it. So do you find wine in that sense different? And we do have one question from, uh, I mean, we have many questions, but we're trying to pick a couple of questions which we think might be relevant to answer. Someone asked, do any of the Indian reserve wines qualify as fine wine and which can be stored for years? The answer, of course, is no. But do, in, in fact, throw light on which precisely are the wines that, that are the kinds that are really investment worthy, specifically which countries or regions we might be talking about? OK, so 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 the answer as to whether India is producing fine wines is is is, is producing some fantastic wines. And I spend a lot of time in India and I love trying them. Um, is it producing any investment wines? The answer is no. Um, and that is nothing to do with quality. Uh, and in actual fact, there's, there's an important point to make here. The, there's a funny thing that quality is not the most important factor with regard to an investment wine. There are other things that come into play. And, and probably the most important is the pedigree, the history of the vineyard. And uh, it takes quite a long time for young upstarts, you know, vineyards that have only been around for 100 years or so, to actually break into the, um, into the investment scene. So really, the, the, the investment scene is dominated by um, well uh, wines from the old world, um, principally the, the you know the top wines from Bordeaux and from Burgundy, um, various other places in, um, in in France. Italy is a big player, um, and these wines have have a huge dominance, and it really is due to the history of winemaking uh, and the desirability of those wines, consequently, and the fact that they have a secondary market. Right now, this is the key. This is the key to this question. Um, when you're buying wine uh, to, as an investment, you want to be able to sell it, right? If you can't sell something, you shouldn't invest in it in the first place. And there are precious few wines that enjoy a ready liquid secondary marketplace. Um, and it's very important that one is investing uh, into those. So that's why there are no Indian wines on the investment scene. Um, it's why the old world does dominate, but new world wines are coming onto the scene in, in, in spades. In actual fact, if you look at the last 12 months in the market, some of the North American wines, the Napa wines, have been killing it. They've been uh, making mincemeat of uh, Bordeaux over the last 12 months. So, so there's quite a lot of diversity in there. I mean, I, I love that there's that diversity there because, you know, you mentioned before some other asset classes with wine. There are so many different opportunities. Yes. You know, there, there are perhaps... At any given moment in time, there are perhaps 3,000 or so opportunities that the sensible investor might want to consider. And of course, they all move at different rates and at different times. Uh, and so, you, you know, you can diversify not just into wine, but within wine. And, uh, and I think that's, that's, you know, again, with my stockbroker's hat on, that's one of the things that makes my heart sing, because we've got a proper marketplace on our hands rather than just a boring old, you know, homogenous graph like oil or gold love, or, you know, yeah, whatever yeah. else. It no, I love how you answered that question, David, because what we're essentially saying is over and above quality, which is a given, right? When you're talking about fine wines, the quality is almost sort of a given. But what, you, what we're looking for as three other parameters, which are equally important or even more so, is one, they're made in finite quantities, because if an Indian wine, for example, were to make it in this, then obviously the producer was in a position to ramp up the production at any point in time. Is it? So we want them to be made in finite quantities. So there is a feeling of scarcity. And so more people want it, which leads me to the second point, which is there's a global demand. And global demand is important also from a reselling point of view. Like at any point in time, you should be able to make your liquid, um, uh, you know, uh, shouldn't be illiquid, right? Your your liquid shouldn't be illiquid and you should be able no to pun intended, right? <laughs> as quickly as possible. And the third is the legacy, the history and the pedigree um, of, of the producer, the estate, just having a long, long history of being in the business of good wine making. 
Where can a person learn about fine wine investments? That's another question. Well, you're learning some of it now, even as you hear David David uh, Jackson from of Amphora Portfolio Management speaking with you. But uh, also, David, guide guide some of our listeners to where else they can go and read up a bit more. Are there, you know? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think I think there are, there are more and more resources out there. We we put a lot of information onto our website actually. Um, and one of our, one, a member of our team actually is a guy called uh, Phil Saverly, who uh, yeah. wore very big pants in the city of London and elsewhere on the investment markets. He was uh, head of global emerging markets for, you know, Deutsche Bank and Merrill's and that sort of thing. Um, and he is the head of our analysis department and he writes um, regular missives that we put up onto our, um, onto our website. And they're actually a really good resource um, he also writes a column for the drinks business. Through lockdown, it's been slightly more sporadic than it used to be, but they are all still there, actually. So um, if you go onto our website, which is um, apmwineinvestment.co.uk, you can find a back catalogue um, of all of these research reports. And they're written in a very informal, friendly style. I think they're one of the best resources, actually, to learn about wine investment. Um, we, we go back to, to, to LiveX. We mentioned them just now. They run a wonderful blog. Um, I think their information is uh, is is priceless because they're one of the um, well. I suppose where, where they're where they're important is that they um, they have really great data um, because so many people are trading through them that they've created a certain amount of transparency with yeah. regard to pricing and that sort of thing. I'd like to come back actually in a moment to your question, so not about pricing because there's quite an important point yeah. to make there. Um, yeah. But they um, they 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 also run a blog. But I think the relative infancy of the modern marketplace means that most of the stuff you're going to get online um, rather than, um, uh, to the best of my knowledge, there aren't any sort of, you know, wine investment courses. If you do the WSET, it doesn't sort of touch on wine investment. Perhaps it should, you know, perhaps it's, perhaps but it's I time. But I would like to say, obviously, not, not your website, but in general, for somebody who's trying to just navigate this world on his own and he goes online and tries to read up, um, I often believe that, okay, just if you're just looking for academic purpose, then there's a lot of knowledge you can take in and learn about it. But if somebody were to jump into this, to do this or, or sort of as an investment or put their money down, there can be some risks and volatility involved. And so it's always worth working with somebody you can trust or a partner like Amphora or, you know, someone like that. So uh, can you make us aware of what might go wrong or could go wrong if one were to try this on his own or, or even, yeah. even with a company for that matter, you know? Yeah, why? yeah, no, ab- ab- absolutely. So I think, I think, you know, like, um, like any investment market, um, there are threats and there are dangers and most of these you can mitigate against with a few common sense, um, decisions over time. I mean, you do, of course, have normal market risk. You know, prices don't always go up. It's like any marketplace; prices will go up and they will and they will go down. Um, you can, to some degree, protect yourself from those fluctuations in the marketplace by having a diversified wine portfolio. Um, I, I always try sort of to. I think people often think, "Oh, I quite like the idea of investing in wine." You know, I'll buy one case of wine and see how I get on. And of course, it's just not the right way to approach it because all you've done really is you've had a bit of a punt, you know. If that case of wine goes up, you're having a party. And if it goes down, you think, oh, you know, that was a load of rubbish. Yeah. I'll, uh, you're not really I'll doing it. So, yeah. So it's important to have, you know, a bit of diversification, have a bit of Bordeaux, have a bit of Burgundy, have a bit of Italian, and then maybe have some North American stuff. So so that that's, that's a very important rule, which will help um, protect you from your normal market risk, which is just fluctuations in prices. Now, outside of that, where, where I see people making mistakes, um, there are some classic mistakes um, that, are, that, are, that are far too easy to make. We've already touched on um, the wines with no secondary market. I think that the market is not yet in a place where one should be seeking out the next big thing. Uh, my team a couple of years ago spent... A whole summer trying to resell piles of really fabulous Australian wines that um, a company had set up to advise people to invest in. The company probably went bust. All of these um, investors came to us and said, help, you know, we've got this wine. And it was wonderful stuff. And we just couldn't sell it for them. And the poor investors end up getting, you know, sort of 30 pence in the pound back for these investments that they made. And, and that's because what, what this business purported to do was punt on the next big thing. I think at the moment you need to follow you can be clever, you know, you don't need to make obvious choices, um, but you need to follow a relatively well-trodden path and look for those wines that have nice. a secondary market. 
So you already, um, what I'm hearing you say is only blue chip. No going mid, mid, what's the word, Andrew? Well, I did say there were 3,000 opportunities. So it's not, they can't all be blue chip, but, I, but, but they are all, uh, they are all wines that have got a, red, a ready secondary market. And the reason that I say that there are 3,000 opportunities is, is, is not there are 3,000 different winemakers. Uh, there are probably only about uh, 100 to 150 winemakers that you might be interested in investing in. But some of those produce more than one wine. But of course, the key is that every year, every vintage, vintage simply being the year Correct. of production, uh, they produce a product which is absolutely unique from an investment perspective. Correct. Investing in Chateau Margaux from 1990 compared to 2005 is a completely different thing. In fact, even just you know one year apart will be a completely different thing. So, um, so that's what I mean by a well-trodden path. But I think within that, there are certainly wines that are coming to the forefront and wines where you're taking, you know, a little bit more risk, but perhaps with an eye to a little bit more return. And again, that's something, I, I guess, you're right. You probably do need a good advisor for that. I'll tell you the other mistake that I see people making. And this is something that, that I think people do very naturally and it seems logical, um, but people often take their wine home so that they can keep a close eye on it and they know where it is and they know that it's being well looked after disaster right the minute you take your wine home you make it almost unsellable because of course nobody knows you know nobody knows whether you stored it you know in the airing cupboard on top of a radiator drank it refilled it with ribena you know there's no there's no history so so a, a golden rule when investing in wine is, uh, is is keep your wine in a bonded warehouse that's a tax-free warehouse um an even better rule is actually to leave it in london that's not me being London centric. It's uh, it's uh, it's just me being matter of fact because London is the sort of trading hub for wine internationally. And what's happened over the years is that London has become sort of accepted as the benchmark in bonded warehousing. And so your your if your wine is in a bonded warehouse in London, it's kind of the guarantee to your next buyer that the wine is um, is what it's supposed to be, and um, that it's um, that it's got good provenance, that it's been well stored, uh, and it makes it just so much easier to sell. So that, that, again, that's a trap that people can fall into. And a third trap uh, is that you don't want to buy anything that's too old, right? Um, if you get to be a real expert, you can buy the old stuff, but it's like the antique market. You know, if you're trading in wines that are 50, 60, 70 years old, they're unique. They're like works of art. Each one is very different to the other. Um, and it does require a level of expertise that's way above what one would normally need. The person in the street can really safely, really happily invest in wine if they're investing in young wine. Because young wine in a bonded warehouse, it, it, you know, it's, 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 it's fungible. I mean, as a trader, if I go to the marketplace and I want to buy myself a case of whatever, you know, 2015 Chateau Lafitte Rothschild, if there are 20 cases for sale and they're all in bond, I'm buying the cheapest one. I don't care which one it is because they're all the same thing to me. So again, that's another that's another rule for novices coming to the marketplace. So follow follow a, a, a you know relatively well trodden path. Make sure that those wines trade. Um, the way you can do that is probably by asking a few you know, people in the trade, a few wine experts, whether they think it's got a secondary market. Don't buy anything too old and stick to wine in bond. That's a golden rule. So stick to wine and bond, guys. That's an important point because one of you is asking, how do you think the high import tax rate in India, is it profitable to invest in wine? When you're investing in wine, you're not, like David explained, you're not actually bringing the wine into India. So you're not having to pay any import tax on it. You are keeping these wines overseas stored professionally under professional storage conditions. So where does Amphora Portfolio Management keep us wines? And um, is it all on paper, the investment, or do people actually get, not actual custody, but they, they actually own physical bottles that are stored on behalf of them? Yeah, that's correct. They do. Yeah. So so the, so the practicalities of investing in wine, or, or certainly the practicalities of investing in wine through Amphora, um, are, are that each of our clients has their own portfolio of wine to which they have legal title. It's their asset. Um, now, we babysit that wine for them in, uh, in our warehouse. And our warehouse is just outside London, actually, a place called Tilbury Docks um, in, a, in a sort of very secure bonded warehouse. It's like a sweet shop for me when I go there. There's all these beautiful old wooden cases and every dream wine you could, you could ever imagine uh, is down there. Um, and uh, so all of our clients have their wine in, in that bonded warehouse. And of course, 
the fact is it's their wine if they want to drink it if they want to take it home then they're very welcome to do so because they they they, they do own it but we will actually um, go as far as breaking the contract if somebody takes their wine out of bond because we can't help them from 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 that point onwards so it does mean that for um for uh, an indian investor it's incredibly straightforward actually you know subject to the uh you know the allowances of moving money out of india and all that sort of stuff that uh, has to be taken care of um at a at a local level from a uk um perspective it's very easy and in fact that's why india has become such an important marketplace for us i think perhaps what we haven't mentioned yet is why i'm here from london as opposed to any of the other uh, investment advisors and that's because we have um, a flourishing business in india um we have a um a, a, a business operating now we have a managing director in the region called cecilia oldner who was uh, a friend of yours so and uh, her, her history is that she was one of the uh, one of the big wigs one of the driving forces behind a little tiny vineyard that some of you might have heard of called sula wines you might spot it now and again throughout throughout india and she runs the operation there and i was coming to india before lockdown i was coming to india uh, six times a year in actual fact and man do i miss it <laughs> from uh, from lockdown but so i have a lot of experience um of uh, helping indian investors specifically indian investors some domiciled in india some international investing into fine wine and we have a lot of clients there i i actually thought in 2019 i thought that india um was going to overtake um the rest of the world apart from the uh, the, the uk as our bigger marketplace and of course that was completely torpedoed by uh by this bug that everyone started catching but nonetheless yeah. india remains very important and i think that uh, india is uh, i mean if, you know for the wine well that's what the summit is about right for the for, for the wine world in general india is the beating pulse now it's part of the future and it's so important well that's encouraging to hear that's amazing and it's it's great to see that your business in india is is flourishing because i increasingly get a lot of people asking me how do we go about it and you know so on so it's great to see we should say hello to cecilia because i know she's live and she's listening into us we um, should also say happy birthday it was her birthday just last week so happy oh, birthday to cecilia yes of course well, I, i was wondering what you were saying because i do know when her birthday is i sh- she and i share our birthdays actually well, oh well, happy birthday to you as well in that case thank for last week you, thank you okay well i'm i'm getting excited now about everything that you've been telling us so I'm going to dive into more sales related questions. Tell us who's <laughs> best suited. Who's best suited to do this? Um who's a good profile of person who can do this and how much money do I need to deep right, dive? Right, okay. Oh, okay, fine. So, um so I learned a, a sort of hard lesson a long time ago about trying to work out exactly who a wine investor is because I think that it's so broad and long that it's very difficult yeah. to define so what 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 we've done over the course of time is we've is we've developed a sort of a number of different propositions that will cater to different needs um because the wine investor wears many hats right and so on the one hand you might have someone who is an absolute enthusiast loves fine wine um they they they're in the game because of their joy of fine wine um and their investment is probably to help them drink fine wine more cheaply or free even if they can if they can um you know engineer sufficient returns and rewards out of their portfolio and then at the other end you've got the very pragmatic wine investor who looks at it and says well look, you know this is great i can see that it, it, it there are certain ways in which it's non correlated to the other marketplaces it's a physical asset i like the fact that i have the security and the tangibility uh, non denominated in uh, in 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 rupees internationally traded so they're taking a very pragmatic approach and they might not care less about what wines are investing because they don't have an emotional attachment to it. Now we we will of course cater for both sides of the equation and anywhere in between. Um the the decisions as to what populates their portfolios will of course be slightly different because one's motivated by emotion and the other one's motivated purely by maximizing the the profit out of it. So I this, suppose it doesn't this, really matter on that. This combination that by the way, sorry to cut you short, but this combination sounds exactly like me and Andrew by the way. I'm the <laughs> I'm the person who gets all emotional about everything I I buy and Andrew's the one like, okay, how much money is it making? Let's sell it without thinking, you know. So but There we go. You see you 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 I'm 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 almost like your uh, your love child, sort of half wine and half finance, you see. Yeah, <laughs> so, that's the combo- that's our combination. Yeah, exactly, exactly. If you do Yeah exactly if you have little ones they're going to end up like me I warn you. 
Um, so, but anyway, so within that, I think the, the, the second part of the question is how much one needs to commit to the marketplace. Now, regrettably, this isn't a super cheap investment to get involved with. No. And the reason it isn't super cheap is that um, is that all of these fancy wines cost an arm and a leg. And, and in actual fact, if you're going right at the top of the tree, it's not unusual for some of these wines to cost a lakh rupees a bottle. And you're buying them in cases of six or 12 bottles. Again, you, you trade in unbroken cases. Now, they're not all that expensive, of course, but it, but it does mean that in order to get a bit of diversification in your portfolio, um, you, you're not going to get much below five lakh rupees as a start point for investing in, in in fine wine. But if someone comes along with that sort of investment level, we'd be very happy to guide them and get them started. And, and Okay, so and five lights doesn't sound like a lot. And, you know, I mean, 10 It's not crazy. It's not, it's not crazy, is it? But it's not, it's yeah. It's a starting yeah. point, right? But, um, yeah, exactly. For as little as 10 lakhs, for example, how many yeah. cases of wine could we could we buy? Well, so so it, again, it's the the investment level doesn't necessarily dictate the number of cases, um, because if you came with uh, with um, ten lakh, what we would not put into the portfolio is a case of Petrus. Petrus, <laughs> which pick the same wine uh, that costs nine lakh, right? Because you get that, and you get one other case of. Ponte Canet or something, and you've got two cases of wine. You've got a polarised wine portfolio. It's a nonsense. You haven't made a good start. So what? So when someone's got a 10 lakh, what we want is uh, is um, five to 10 cases that cost one to two lakh each. That, that, that's where it goes. Now, what, what happens as you um, increase that investment spend, when it gets up, gets up to 20 lakh and, 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 and more and more and more, is you get a bit more flexibility on, on what you can put in there because... There are some wines that you would want to have in your investment portfolio. You know, for example, the first growths from uh, Bordeaux are the, the, we mentioned blue chips before, they are the bona fide out and out blue chips. You know, they should be in a portfolio. They should be the backbone of a portfolio. Um, if chosen carefully to get the ones that are showing the best value, they can show really great returns. But they are three to six lakh per case. So they can't go into the smaller portfolios. Um, so so that's that's the benefit of putting a little bit more money into a portfolio. Yeah. I'm also and wondering if to, the quantum of the money was slightly less, uh, yeah. would you be leaning more towards some new world? And and if so, which ones? I know you mentioned Napa, but which are the new world region, in your opinion, starting to get noticed or starting to do better in the fine wine investment scene? On, on, on the investment scene, it's really narrow, actually. So to, to my great frustration, you know, I, I, I really want our portfolios to have some of this amazing stuff that's coming out of Argentina and Chile and South Africa and various other yeah. places because about Australia. You know, it's really any, cool any stuff. part of Australia. Yes, yeah, absolutely. So Australia so so Australia and um and the US are really the sectors. You know, <laughs> so you hear, again my stockbroker's hat goes on. I think of geographical regions as sectors, you see, when I'm uh, looking at this with with my stockbroker hat rather than my wine hat. Um and so Napa is a very important sector. Um, and Australia to a certain degree. Now, what's interesting with Australia is that is that as a percentage of the wine it produces, um, it has the highest proportion of fine wine of any producer in the world. But there's not that much on the marketplace currently that trades with a ready secondary market. Remember that, that age-old problem, you've got to be able to sell it. Um, and up until a few years ago, it was pretty much Grange, 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 and more Grange. But it is starting to... Um, extend a little, so uh, so we can trade now in 707, bin 707 is pretty liquid now. Nice. Um, Hill of Grace is, is getting pretty liquid. But the minute you take a step down to, you know, even something, I, I mean, this one amazes me. So Astralis, you know, gets 100 points from every critic every year, you know, and, and always has done. Wonder, you know, amazing thing, tiny production, beautiful wine, you know, ticks all of the boxes, but you can't sell the mm. stuff enough for money. So that that hasn't yet ticked to the box. So you can see even with something like Australia, which um, from a new world wine, speaking in relative terms, is is a very well established marketplace, is um, is relatively limited. Now, your 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 question about whether the limited budget would mean we look to, to the new world is actually the the opposite, funnily enough, because the Napa wines are so expensive they make your head spin. I mean there's one of the wines that we trade in is a wine uh, from Napa called Screaming Eagle. Um, and it is uh, so. It's, it's a great, you know, we had some really great returns. Yeah, and we had a lot of fun with it. 
But have you ever tried it? Yes, I've been to Screaming Eagle. Oh, I don't think I'll ever get to try it. And vertical then, at Screaming yeah, Eagle. Yeah, okay. So the, 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 the reason I'll never get to try it is that it is about six or seven lakh a bottle. Well, um, I drink and, Huh? I drink yeah, so, <laughs> my Exactly. Yeah, and so and so that that is uh, pound for pound um, is probably battling with Romani Conti now to be the most expensive wine in the world, and that's a new world wine. Um, and the other wines from North America that we we trade in, which are things like Dominus and Opus One, um, to a lesser degree Cinquanon and Harlan, and you know all, all these sort of names that anyone who's got an eye to wine will have come across, even if they haven't tried them. Um, but they're the same price as 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 Tier One and Tier Two. Bordeaux wines. So there's not a saving to be made by um, by buying North American wines. Although over the last 12 months, there has been a financial benefit over Bordeaux from investing in American wines. Incredible. What a, what a great story about Screaming Eagle. I didn't know it's actually uh, competing with the likes of Romani Conti. That's amazing. More That's expensive than Petrus. More expensive... Vintage on vintage, more expensive than Petrus yeah, now. So it's amazing. only, right. so only we're Romani Conti. So fortunate because I was in... Uh, uh, Napa Valley uh, about two and a half, three years ago on an MW trip. So we were 40 masters of wine yeah. on a single trip and we visited a whole lot of, you know, went to Ridge. Uh, and then our final crescendo was a visit to Screaming Eagle where they did a vertical tasting with us. So that was, that was, that was the most memorable part of the trip. So no, we used to I'm be not, friends. I'm not, I'm not right. sure this relationship can continue. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, so yeah. that, but that's, I mean, this is, this is, I mean, I think it's quite an interesting point, actually, when you look at the price of Scream Eagle. It's not not just Scream Eagle, but the value of these wines mean that, um, you know, um, real real world people like me are priced out of a lot of these super duper wines. You know what I mean? I have a couple of mates who, who, you know, we used to collect wines together and it was our thing on a Saturday that we would all take around a bottle of First Growth Bordeaux and, and, and we and we tried them together. And at that time, they were costing me about 100 quid. Now, of course, a bottle of fully mature first yeah. Bordeaux is 10, 10 times that, you know. So uh, so the prices, I think the prices to people who haven't invested in wine before make their head swim. And we often come to us, yeah. we often have people come to us and they they, they will invest, you know, £10,000 or £20,000, 10 lakh, 20, 20 lakh. Um, and we'll take them to see their wine in the warehouse. And of course, they're expecting this huge pile of wines. And we yeah. go, you know, there it is, it's those... It's those four cases in the corner. I think people feel a little crestfallen <laughs> at the amount that's there. Yeah. But of course, that's not the point. The fact, the matter of fact, is that one of the great desires of wine is that it is so expensive. To some extent, it's almost right. well. I would no, not even almost. Actually, it is a Veblen good. Um, in so much as in 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 the marketplace, right at the top, with the Screaming Eagles and the Romney Contes. Tens of thousands of pounds a bottle sometimes. Um, the more expensive it gets, the more desirable it gets. And I'll tell you something else. Yeah. This is a really sobering thought about wine. You know, we talked about the uniqueness of wine compared to other luxury assets at the start of this. There is there is one facet of wine which is absolutely unique, and that's that you get to use it once. And I would question how many people would be buying Louis Vuitton handbags. And Rolex watches, if they got to use them once, and then they had to uh, chuck them in the furnace. Um, yeah. And when you when you think of it in those terms, it kind yeah. of makes wine the ultimate luxury. Doing, good. Paying all that money for a one time experience. I never it's thought it. of it like that. <laughs> it's the it's the only luxury right, that's made to be destroyed. It's like you're drinking all of that, you know, thousand pounds in one go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. No, and you have it in the glass and you think, well, so, that's, yeah. that's 100 pounds there. It's the highest level of, cons it's almost like food, right? But of course, we don't eat such expensive food, but it's almost like when you pay a lot of food for, a lot of money for a really great food. It's like yeah. you're consuming it instantly and it's gone. It's done and done. Yeah, I often, when I, when I do when I do sort of wine tastings and things like that, I often, I often pose the question to people. I say, can anybody else think of a luxury item that has these same characteristics? It can only produce in finite quantities it gets rare over the time and it's, and it can only be used yeah. once and people really do struggle to come up with it. But food uh, food comparisons are really the only thing that comes close. I mean, people sometimes cite things like caviar and, uh, no, not, you know, that brings me to the point. Caviar. I have a lot of, lot of questions <laughs> to ask you, David, but the, what that leaves me with is the point that if you get to consume it only once, 
then all you're left with is the brand value beyond that, right? Because all you have is pictures to show for it. Hopefully social media helps because you've managed to post a couple of those pictures and let the whole world know you drank it. So Instagrammable. But it's so Instagrammable. But really the brag value is what you left. There's so much brag value to the fine wine investment scene, even while you're an investor or well yeah. after you consume something really that expensive, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree. And I think, I think that brag factor um, transposes into wine investment as well because there's something rather lovely about being the owner of a few cases of Chateau Lafitte Rothschild and Chateau Latour. And it becomes, I think that a lot of our, a lot of our investors, you know, even those, when I mentioned before that a lot of our um, clients start out very pragmatic, um, but I think even those people can't help but fall a little bit in love with it. Yes. And it's a sort of dinner party topic to talk about. And I think yes. on that basis, it makes it a lovely thing to invest in. It's one of the things actually that we've been, we, we've, we've had to get a really fine balance over the, um, over the 12 years we've been in operation, which is being thoroughly professional because we're, we're, we're taking responsibility for other people's money and we take that responsibility as seriously as any financial advisor does or should. Um, but equally, we're wine people, you know, we're all wine people and we, and, and, and we love the stuff. And I would hate to think that our messages in any way sort of dragged the joy yeah. and the romance out of wine. So we, so we do an awful lot of stuff where we immerse the clients into fine wine and we do, we do sort of blind tastings where they get to try the really fancy stuff compared to supermarket stuff to see if they can tell the difference and all these sort of things that, that will educate people and get them really engaged with fine wine so that, so that our hope is that they don't end up as just the wine investor, but perhaps... So I attended one such blind tasting that you had hosted in Mumbai a few years ago. Remember, that's where we met, actually, David. Yeah, 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 yeah. that's right. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's scary having a master of wine in the audience. I have to be on my toes, you see. <laughs> um, it was an obvious guess, though, the supermarket wine versus the, the, the wine. I can't remember which one you serve, but uh, it was an obvious one. But I did shut up. I didn't say anything. I let the other <laughs> the, the table guess. Um, You're being very okay, kind and sparing few, my blushes, I think. We have a few direct questions now. We're getting down to the, the brass tax. What is the potential rate of return vis-a-vis -vis any other alternative investment that we can expect? Or what is the ideal commitment time frame of wine investment that one can expect to hold a wine portfolio for? I right, okay. So, so yeah, okay. So, so in, um, uh, in index terms... Um, if you go back, so the benchmark index is, again, we could refer to our friends at LiveX. Um, they produce the most reliable indices in the marketplace. Um, the LiveX 100, which as you might imagine, tracks a bundle of the 100 most frequently traded wines in the, um, in the wine investment space is the benchmark. Now, Thomson Reuters. And if you track that back in time, you've got a long-term performance of just over 10%. Uh, now, that performance was wildly higher than that until 2012, but there was enormous correction in the wine market in 2012. I think you felt the pain of that actually in your own uh, portfolio, and that was a consequence of China clamping down on corruption, but I can tell you more about that if that's of interest to anybody. Um, but that's brought that long-term performance down to about that level. Now, my view is that one can do considerably better than that, uh, but one has to be making, well, there, there are two ways to do it. The first one is that you make better choices. So uh, you don't just want to buy all the 100 wines that are in the index. You want to buy, find a way to isolate those wines that you believe are the best ones from the 100 wines in the index. You want to have those in your portfolio. And the second way that you increase those returns is that you, um, is that you trade the wines on a reasonably regular basis. Don't just sit there waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. So, so my belief is that a traded portfolio will perform far better than uh, a static portfolio. Um, we, we aim, we will tell clients at the time that they're investing that what we would like to do is double their invested funds um, over a period of five years. Um, and to achieve that, we've got to get 12 and a bit percent per year. And uh, if we're not outperforming the market, doing it's 10.3% by that amount, what are we in business for? So that's the sort of returns that we're looking at. Um, now, within that, really exciting things sometimes happen. Um, and uh, a great, in fact, a lot of my clients in India actually benefited from uh, 
Uh, Margot 2015 was an investment that we put into people's portfolios a few years ago. And uh, for all sorts of weird and wonderful uh, reasons, it trebled in value in, uh, in an 18 month period. So you sometimes get these pockets, bursts of activity, which can really boost your returns into these portfolios. So I think that that's that's the trick to maximizing it. You've got to have someone keeping their eye on it for you. Or keep, keep you know if, if you can if you can keep an eye on it yourself, then that's fine. You can you can also do that. But you want to be find a way to select the right wines. And I can talk to you about how to do that if we're interested in a minute. We can come back to that topic. Um, and uh, and keep trading them. As a timeline horizon, I think that um, sensibly speaking, three years should be a commitment. And at Amphora, we're much happier if someone gives us a five-year timeline. That's a sort of that's a, a, a period that we're very comfortable with. I think for those investors who like in and out markets and prefer doing things that can take place within twelve months, it's the wrong marketplace. You should probably look elsewhere. Hmm. But I'm glad this question was asked and that you're able to answer that it's a it's a three to five year because also what a lot of people tend to do is feel very impatient, right? Someone puts in the money and says, okay, what am I going to get next year for it? And wine prices don't really fluctuate that much year on year, I'm assuming, yeah. but, you know, yeah. Yeah, so well, again, it's um, it comes, the, the, the fluctuation of wine prices is quite an interesting question because what we're talking, what we were talking about then was the market in index terms. Now, of course, an index never shows the full picture because when you've got something like wine, which is in so many sectors, I mean, when 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 we analyse the market looking for opportunities, we break the uh, marketplace down into geographical sectors and Bordeaux's got five sectors alone, you know, and then you move into the other bits of France and all around the world and we end up with something like 19 different sectors that people can invest into yeah. and they all move at different rates and at different times. And so, uh, and so, you know, over the last 12 months, had your portfolio been exclusively Bordeaux, it'd have been a bit of a boring experience, if I'm honest, not much was happening. Um, but if your portfolio had been made of um, Super Tuscans from North Italy and Napa Valley wines, you'd have been having a blast. Now, that might not be the case for the next 12 months. In fact, it's unlikely to be the case for the next 12 months, because one of the reasons that Bordeaux was um, stagnating a little bit, just plodding along and being a bit boring, was that our good old mate, Mr. Trump, remember him? Yeah. Um, he, um, oh, can we he forget? Bit, yeah. <laughs> he got crossed with the European Union. He thought that they were playing silly watsits with uh, Airbus and giving them a competitive advantage over Boeing. So he slapped a 25% tax on some luxury items from Europe. And one of those was French wine. Um, and it killed the North American market because that's a hell of a tax, in, you know, in addition to their normal import duties and the other stuff that uh, yeah. went on top of it. Now, uh, losing the American marketplace has been one of the hindrances for Bordeaux. But of course, we have a new administration and we have a new uh, trade representative, Catherine Tay, and she has already suspended that tariff. And it looks now almost certain that, uh, that she'll abolish that tariff that's amazing. Um, that's incredible. as soon as she can get it passed through the Senate. And so it's going to be Bordeaux's time in the sun again, right? So this, again, this is yeah. how you maximise your profits. So if you if you were an investor in fine wine and you've done very well last year with your Sasakaya and your uh, Opus One and whatever else, now it's time to sell a bit of that, take a bit of profit and stick it into a bit of Chateau Lafitte and a bit of uh, Ponte Canet and whatever else. Thank you. Be. I was going to ask so, you, give us some tips and you are already giving us some. So I have one final question for you, David, and yeah. that is um, Bordeaux, since you mentioned Bordeaux, has seen embarrassingly great vintages in the recent past, isn't it? It's almost now become impossible to have a bad vintage in Bordeaux. Vintage fatigue, I think. Was yes, it's like good vintage fatigue. It's like one great yeah. vintage after another. Is that yeah. good for your business or bad for your business? What I mean is, does that create oversupply and maybe then rationalize price or whatever? Or, or is it great because that means there's more wine and more people can jump into it, more people can have access to the kind of wines that they want to have in their portfolio? How do you see this? We don't care less, actually, about the quality of a vintage. Now, just because a vintage is poor quality doesn't mean that it's going to be a bad investment. And in actual fact, it could be the total opposite of that. Um, a really great example of this is that um, when China piled into the marketplace from about 2005, yeah. um, the market went absolutely loopy because, of course, you know, it's a tiny marketplace. We estimate the international marketplace is probably about six and a half to seven billion US dollars annually. 
um, you know, that's traded in London and gold on a on a weekly basis. It's a really small marketplace. And so when you had the mobilization of a country the size of China into the marketplace, it it it, it went crazy and prices launched at a rate of knots. Now, what, what happened was that the that people were learning about wine in China. This isn't to be disparaging to the Chinese wine drinker. They they now know more than I do, and they keep me on my toes when, when I go to China, which is rare these days. But in those days, they were just learning, right? And so what they wanted was the experience. They wanted to experience Chateau Lafitte. They wanted to experience Chateau Aubryon. So what they were doing is they were buying the cheapest ones that they could do to, to, to get the drinking experience. And where did the cheapest ones come from? They came from the poor vintages. So what happened from about 2005 is that the weaker vintages, the less desirable vintages in the traditional European and North American markets, went crazy. They were the right ones to invest in. And that effect is still seen to this day um, that what we what we tend to see in the marketplace is a sort of push-me-pull-you effect, that um, there'll be a differential between strong vintages and weak vintages, a price differential. If that differential is great, then the poor vintages will start to look cheap and people will yes. buy them and push the price up. If the differential, as the differential contracts, it starts to make the good vintages look cheap. The logic being, well, hang on a second, you know, I'm uh, if I'm buying the stuff, I might as well just pay a little bit more and get the really good stuff. And so the good stuff takes off. So we find now, from a Bordeaux perspective specifically, that it's cyclical as to whether we want people investing in the very best vintages or yeah. the poorer vintages. So we don't care about the quality of the vintage. Um, I think that... Um, a, a slightly different effect of having all these great vintages is that one of the um, effects of the modern market is that the chateau went crazy and they started putting the release prices up Correct. at levels that made no sense. Yeah. And so the new primary market, this is where you buy the wines before they're bottled. You buy it when it's still sloshing around in the barrel. It's called on primeur. Right. Um, that marketplace really died for us. 10 years ago, that was probably 30 to 40% of the trading we did. It's now probably no more than 2 or 3% because of these silly prices, because it makes no sense, right? Why would you buy the new vintage more expensively than you can buy a back bottled vintage where you already know the quality, it's guaranteed, and it's got some bottle age, and it's further along its um, improvement curve to the point that it starts to get consumed. So that's the main effect that we've noticed by all these super duper vintages coming out one after. That is amazing, David. You really fired up our passion for, you know, <laughs> investment with passion, right? So that's that's what it's called. This has been such an enriching session. You've shared with us uh, so much. There's been so much to take in. And you. I just love the way you've gone into all this detail and we've sort of broken it down into, you know, um, a complete detail for everybody to understand. There's been a lot of questions, lots of people throwing in comments saying this was great. This was a good eye opener. This was a good learning experience. So I can't thank you enough, David. Thank Absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. And guys, David Jackson from Amphora Portfolio Management. Tell us your website again, David. Uh, it's uh, APM Alpha Papa Mike Wine Investment dot co dot UK. And thank That's you for it. listening, everybody. My, o my only regret is I'm having to do it from London and not from Mumbai. But there we go. Soon. But you will be here very soon, just as the doors open for international training. Just as soon as they let me. <laughs> and uh, we'll uh, we'll we'll have a glass of wine, you know, not not screaming eagle, but something nice, something wonderful, nonetheless. I look forward to that. Brilliant! Lovely. Thanks so much. Okay. Good, good Cheers. Day. Bye. 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 -bye.
For the part-time bonsai artist, who's a full-time investment banker, here's a piece of art that happens to be a decanter. Introducing the hosting collection by Shazé. Hey friends, welcome back. That was a really interesting session on fine wine investments. And now we're going to take a deep dive into Napa Valley, one among the most iconic regions around the world. Today, we're going to take a deep dive into Napa Valley to understand the winemaking, the terroir, the, the iconic wine producers. So we have a few minutes where I'll run you through an interesting presentation talking about understanding Napa Valley a bit more in a deeper explora exploration. And after that, I will then introduce you on a panel discussion and invite you to join us on a panel discussion with three incredible wine producers of Napa Valley, where we will ask them questions and, you know, just understand more about Napa Valley as a wine producing region. So just allow me a minute. I'm just going to get my presentation up and it's... with you in a second. Your interest in Napa Valley as a region. We're very excited to share this information with you about what makes Napa Valley one of the best winemaking regions in the world. So no matter what your background or where you come from, hopefully this presentation will leave you with a better appreciation of Napa Valley as a wine producing region and some new insights into how wines in Napa Valley are made, right? Okay, so let's look at what the brand promise is. What does Napa Valley really offer? Napa Valley stands for wines of the highest quality, cultivated with excellence in one of the world's most extraordinary places. Over the course of this presentation, we'll dive into understanding the specific geography, soils, climate, technology, history, 
environmental and social sustainability of the Napa Valley. Let's first understand from the very basics. What does the word Perua mean? So generally we define Perua as a combination, as the natural environment which a particular wine is produced, and it combines factors such as soil, topography, and climate. Now, for the purpose of this presentation, I'd like to propose that we also add a fourth element, which is people, because at the end of the day, people make such a huge difference to how wines get made, right? A, a human being makes so many decisions and has a stylistic vision of how he wants to make his wines, his or her wines. So, we, I like to always add a fourth element beyond soil, topography, and climate, which is people. And there, somewhere between all of these, lies Napa Valley's unique terroir, and there is the intersection of Napa Valley's culture of quality winemaking and the physical environment when all put together is what makes Napa Valley the most unique wine-producing region in the world. Let's have a look at where Napa Valley is situated. So when you look at Napa Valley, one thing to understand is it's in a really, really important location. If you see, it is coastal, it's close to the coast, but it's not really right at the coast. It's not so inward where it's too hot or it becomes part of the central coast, but, or central valley rather, but it is not absolutely at the very edge either. And this climate is what makes Napa Valley neither too hot nor too cold, and this enables to grow quality wine grapes. The valley is bordered between two mountain ranges, and it is also located about an hour from San Francisco. So incredibly accessible. If you take a flight onto San Francisco, you can hop into a car, and within an hour, you would be at the Napa Valley. It's precisely this location that gives Napa Valley its unique mix of attributes and allows the vintners of Napa Valley to produce world-class wines. Now, Napa Valley, interestingly, was the first ABA, ABA as I refer to as the American Viticultural Areas. So that is what they call the legally defined area uh, within Napa Valley. And Napa Valley was among the first ABAs to be established in California in 1981. What is an ABA? It's a geographically legally defined grape growing area that produces or possesses distinguishable characteristics, very unique, uh, particular characteristics, including a certain type of climate, a certain type of terroir, terrain, topography, soil, and mixed with some cultural and historical distinction. All of these combinations are unique to every place in the world, and particularly for Napa Valley, they are unique, so unique, which we will discover now over the next few slides, they're so unique, that it makes Napa Valley among the most distinguishable and most iconic regions in the world. Now, since 1981, to date, there are 16 AVAs that have been recognized within the Napa Valley ABA as a whole. Now, the sheer number of these ABAs, each with their own unique and definable attributes, speaks to the diversity of terroir that lies within the larger Napa Valley ABA's terroir, right? There's so much, so much going on within a small region. ABAs, you may say, you may say, oh, is this the same as Appalachians that we know of from the European countries? It's slightly different. European Union and its Appalachians are more I would say more regulated, they have more rules. AVAs are in fact strict geographical designations, so in terms of geographical boundaries, they're extremely well defined. However, they do not limit creativity, freedom of style, freedom of experimentation, and being able for, you know, for, for a vintner to be able to show his own distinctive style of winemaking. So there's a lot of flexibility on the type of grapes that are grown, the viticulture and winemaking methods that a vintner may adopt, or the kind of eels that he may want to sort of, you know, grow the um, crop with. So there's a lot of freedom for creativity and experimentation and, and showcasing one's own uh, style, unique style. Uh, so that is, I suppose, what makes an ABA differ from uh, a European Union 
appellation. And when you see an ABA mentioned on the label of a wine, you should know that almost 85% of the grapes that go into the making of that wine come from that specific ABA, still allowing about 15% sort of flexibility for the wine grapes to come from regions other than the ABA mentioned on the label. Now, you may think, you know, we all know of Napa Valley. We constantly think of Napa Valley as such an important region. Who doesn't know of Napa, Napa Valley? I remember when we did our consumer research study uh, after Nasik, which is a, you know, the, an, an important wine producing region in India. And it's only natural that every Indian would know that India produces wines in Nasik. The second most recognizable region in the world among Indian wine consumers was Napa Valley. You know, when we ask people who else in the world you know makes wines, after Nasik, it was Napa Valley that featured top. So Napa is, is such a recognizable, easy to recall sort of a name. One might think Napa Valley is so big, but in fact, in fact, it's quite a small region. Napa Valley produces only 4% of the entire California's annual grape harvest. Napa Valley has close to 46,000 acres, which is about one sixth of the size of Bordeaux's planted acreage, right? So in terms of vines under plant, it's only one sixth the size of Bordeaux. And the valley itself is about 30 miles long and five miles wide, a little bit like Mumbai actually, much like, you know, it's long and it's kind of narrow. Right. The valley, uh, therefore, you know, is, is very close to the to the San Pablo Bay and the Pacific Ocean. And that is what makes the terroir of Napa Valley so unique. But let me ask you a question just out of curiosity. What percentage of the world's wines do you think Napa Valley produces? Any guesses? How much do you think in percentage terms does Napa Valley produce as a percentage of the global uh, production? You will be surprised to know Napa Valley produces merely four tenths, 0.4 percent of the world's wines. This is really very little. It's less than one percent, right? So for the for for as less as the production is, Napa Valley enjoys a really stellar reputation in the world of wines. Only nine percent of the total area in Napa Valley is planted to grape wines. And most of the producers of Napa Valley are really small scale producers. I, I wouldn't say small scale, but they're really family owned, you know, really sort of boutique sort of wineries. Nearly 80% of Napa Valley vintners, which are 550 member wineries, which represent a, an overwhelming majority of wineries and wine production in Napa Valley. And these collectively make, or not collectively, individually make less than 10,000 cases of wine in a year. So you can, you can, you know, just like some of the top bracket wines of Bordeaux, for example, that make no more than 15,000 cases, 20,000 cases max, a large percentage of Napa Valley producers produce no more than 10,000 cases of wine a year. So really that makes wine that much more desirable. There's a massive global demand for these wines. Uh, people are constantly looking to get their hands on these wonderful wines. Uh, and it kind of keeps mystique sort of going, right? Okay, what does this slide show us? 95% of all Napa Valley wineries, whether they are members of the Napa Valley Vintners, NVV, the association, which we will talk about a bit later, or they are non-member, most of them are family owned and operated. Why is this important in the world of wines? Because I think what we're trying to establish is that these are not commercial wineries. These are not large scale wineries where there is not much thought to quality or the, the production is very commercial. Uh, it's very sort of templatized. Here you are dealing with vintners who are very passionate about quality, have a very specific vision of what they want, are trying to make. And they really are trying to live up the dream of creating something unique, something world class to offer you as consumers. So that is what makes it very unique. Now, although Napa Valley is so small and, you know, controls only 0.4% of the global production of wine, 
the impact of Napa Valley is really huge. In spite of its small size, the Napa Valley wine industry has a big presence in the local community. There's a lot that it gives back and it creates nearly 43,000 jobs in Napa County. It has an annual local economic impact of over 9.4 billion dollars and that is a lot of lot of money right i mean when i compare it to some of the industries in other countries this is a big big impact that napa valley has on the overall global economy but also within americas now let's look at what the grape varieties are that thrive here on your slide you can see so many different varieties and you might say well some of these are early ripening some of these are late ripening some of these varieties thrive in cooler climates some of these thrive in much warmer climates and that's the beauty the beauty is that napa valley offers such diverse growing conditions that dozens of varieties flourish in napa valley the conditions here are well suited both to cool climate varieties such as chardonnay and pinot noir as well as robust red grape varieties such as cabernet sauvignon merlot cabernet franc and so on however the region's top six varieties are in in this order cabernet sauvignon chardonnay merlot sauvignon blanc pinot noir and zinfandel Let's look at Cabernet Sauvignon. Why are we looking at this closely? Because Cabernet Sauvignon is king and majority of Napa Valley winemakers produce it. We all, when we think of Napa Valley, we think of Cabernet Sauvignon, right? So nearly 90% of all Napa Valley Vintner members make Cabernet Sauvignon or at least a Cabernet-based blend. It accounts for 15% of California's wine grape harvest and it represents 47 percent of napa valley's overall great har grape harvest right so cabernet sauvignon is 50 percent of napa's bearing acreage now napa valley cabernet sauvignon is not cheap to produce it is an expensive grape variety to produce you can produce many other grape varieties for half or even less than half the price but the kind of prices that farmers fetch for the napa valley cabernet sauvignon can sometimes or can be as high as 6.6 .6 times of the statewide average so that in itself shows why napa valley cabernet sauvignon is always pegged at the absolute premium end of the market and all of this is reflected not just in the prices of the wines or prices of the grapes but also the quality in the glass, right? Let's take a closer look at the soils that that have that are in Napa Valley and what sort of sort of soils. Now we don't want to try and get too technical or too academic, but understanding the geology of Napa Valley is important and it is a real key to understanding how vines grow. Vines grow after all in soil and soil is a very important component of the terroir. Uh, there's been a lot of history of rainfall that has eroded mountains, hillsides, all of this wash sediment has come and sort of got deposited on the valley floor. And over time, there's been vegetation that has grown, that has died. It's kind of gone back into the soil. It's created organic matter. And all of this has led to creating a soil heritage that is rich, it is varied, it, it is it provides just the right fodder that you need to to and create a countless combinations of different kinds of soils in which the roots can go deep into and sort of create crops that are amazing. But largely speaking, there are three distinct soil types that you find in Napa Valley, and they are mountain, alluvial, and fluvial. In a nutshell, each of these possess a unique set or these together uh, create a unique set of characteristics which make each wine style unique in themselves. Uh, if you see, generally, if you look at how colorful this slide looks, you will see that there is so much soil diversity in Napa Valley. There is this tiny wine growing region that you see in front of you, and yet there are so many different soil types. There are 33 soil series, and almost 50% of the world's soil orders all exist within Napa Valley. So Napa Valley is a little bit of the entire world packed into this little 
area. Uh, scientifically speaking, there are 12 different kinds of soil types that have been recognized as good quality for wine growing. Six out of those 12 soil types actually exist in the Napa Valley region. And there are hundred kinds of different soil variations where you know there are all kinds of combinations. All of these collectively create grapes or grow grapes that are incredibly unique, that are structured, that are, that are complex uh, so, and, and fruit forward. So what we're looking for, or what these soils enable is making of wines that are concentrated, uh, they really speak of the typicity of the grape that, that goes into production of these vines. And uh, yeah, they're fruit forward. And we all know of Napa Valley is incredibly fruit uh, you know, forward kind of wines, but with a lot of elegance to it. The second aspect of terroir, which we talk about after soil, is in fact climate. We all know that climate has a tremendous effect on the flavor of the grapes. Now, within Napa Valley, you might think, is it too hot? Is it too cold? What makes the Napa Valley climate very unique is that it enjoys a Mediterranean climate. Mediterranean climate means it never rains during the growing season. This is very important because if it rains, it can cause a lot of damage to the crop. It can compromise the quality of the crop. So because it's a dry growing season, it enables the grapes to flourish beautifully uh, without any sort of you know less disease pressure and it allows them to develop really good concentrated flavors we also have a lot of diurnal temperature variations between day and night so even in some regions of napa valley or some avas of napa valley which may be very hot and may sometimes during the summer growing months reach up to 37 or 38 degrees celsius but the nights invariably are very cool. And there is a very sharp drop between the daytime temperature and the nighttime temperature, what we refer to commonly as the diurnal temperature variation. And this really allows the grapes to not scorch or to over ripen or to ripen too quickly. What it allows them to do is to retain their freshness, their vivacity, uh, develop flavors slowly, meaningfully in a way that you know, leads to good phenolic sort of ripeness um, and as well as physiological ripeness. So that is something very unique. You also, because of its proximity to the Pacific Ocean, uh, you also get a lot of fog that creeps in from the cold San Pablo Bay. And this sort of has a lovely moderating effect on the climate. I should have probably moved to the next slide to show you all this uh, because we've been talking about all of this. But in general, it has this, I wanted to show you the next slide actually, which shows you the fog that comes into Napa Valley. And because of its unique position in the coastal ranges, you know, the, the, the marine fog that comes in from the San Pablo Bay keeps a, has a lovely moderating effect on the Napa Valley and ensures that it doesn't get too hot, not too cold, it not too much humidity. You don't want too much humidity because, again, that increases the disease pressure. It keeps the, um, the, the climate really, really world-class and just how you want it to be. The Mediterranean climate is something that is enjoyed by very few regions around the world. And it is commonly believed that it is this kind of climate that is needed to produce wines of world-class quality. Napa Valley enjoys the same climate or somewhat the same climate that is enjoyed by the top Bordeaux sort of wine, you know, chateaus. And so that is what, as another reason that allows Napa Valley to produce wines that compete with some of the best in the world. Right, we've talked about the Mediterranean climate. And basically rainfall primarily happens only over the winter when the vines are dormant, the vines are trying to sort of take in as much as they can to keep it, you know, keep, keep preserving what they need to, to go through the entire growing season thereafter. Let's take a quick look at how vineyard and winery practices also influence how Napa Valley's diverse soils and climate help create high quality wines. Now, when you're planting or farming a vineyard, a grower is able to use both time-tested farming methods and the latest technology which is available through the UC Davis and other research universities. Uh, 
growers in Napa Valley can either use their the latest re, you know rootstock or some of the latest clonal selections to match the attributes of a particular vine to a specific vineyard. The vast majority of the vineyards in Napa Valley are hand farmed, hand harvested. So it allows for a lot of personal intervention and attention to be given to every wine. Basically, the bottom line is great combination of amazing, great soils, the ideal climate, and a farmer's attention to detail in the vineyard is what allows Napa Valley to produce grapes of incredibly high quality, tailored to the environment of the vineyard site and matching the grape variety in question. To continuously help them improve on grape growing and winemaking, Napa Valley growers and winemakers harness the latest technology in the vineyard and the winery. It allows managers, vineyard managers, to constantly think of their farming practices, keep adapting, adapting themselves, draw upon whatever is latest in the world, uh, and be able to implement it with great speed, great efficacy, just to ensure that they remain on top of all the cutting edge changes that are happening around the world. Most of these generally emanating from Napa Valley itself and then being emulated all around the world. What helps Napa Valley winemakers create such unique and high quality wines? It's often said, right, that wine is made in the vineyard. So what is the role of winemaking here? Well, it really is the job of the winemaker to transform the high quality fruit into world-class wines. There's a hell of a lot of decisions that a winemaker has to make at the winery level to ensure that the integrity and the quality of the grapes that have come out of the vineyards is maintained and if anything has to be further enhanced into something wonderful in a way that it expresses not just the winemaker's vision or philosophy or how he wants that style to evolve, but also addresses consumer taste, isn't it? It's, it creates a style that consumers enjoy and refer all around the world. So let's explore a few things that the winemakers do at the winery to ensure great quality comes out. Winemakers in Napa Valley, they pay attention to every small detail of wine production to ensure that they are in control of the process every part of the day. Attention to detail is such an important thing because when you're making wine, it can be one small thing that you overlook and you could virtually spoil all the wine overnight. So attention to detail is so important. Use of the latest technology, which is available indigenously within you know, Napa Valley itself, but constant evaluation of how that wine is evolving. What are the changes that need to take place? How do we need to adapt? And lots of creativity, lots of experimentations, lots of trial and errors, trying different blends, trying vines made from that are that are from different parcels of vineyards, just trying different sort of assemblage or or you know playing with clo clonal selections or or just trying a whole lot of other things which Napa Valley is able to do because you know the AVAs, whilst they are they are legally defined geographical areas, as I mentioned. They're not so strict that they would not allow that degree of experimentation and fun, for that matter, for the winemaker to have in, in order to create something that is never been tried before, I suppose. But more importantly, the last word, I love the word collaboration. You know, teamwork is so important when you, I've, every time I've, I've traveled to Napa Valley, I've seen this great camaraderie between all winemakers. Yes, of course, there's some amount of competition, which is natural, but you know, it's healthy competition. It's not where somebody is wishing ill on someone else. The, the entire, you know, the American dream uh, is at full play in Napa Valley. And every winemaker there is really so deeply passionate about creating a wine that will make Napa Valley as a whole look better. So yes, everybody wants to do better individually, but there's such a great sense of pride about Napa Valley as a region that this whole thing about collaborating and making, you know, doing Napa Valley proud is such an important element that I that I've personally witnessed on my trips to Napa Valley. And now that we've been through the complex story of winemaking in Napa Valley, let me also quickly talk about what is the Napa Valley Vintners and what is it that we're doing today. Uh, I won't go into too many details, but Napa Valley Vintners is an association that is here to promote, protect, and enhance the Napa Valley. 
Those are the three key words. They exist. There are member, there are wineries in Napa Valley that are members of the Napa Valley Vintners mission and their mission being to overall promote Napa Valley all around the world, protect them and enhance the reputation and the quality of the wines of Napa Valley. The work of the Napa Valley Vintners falls into three broad categories, therefore. It is marketing and promoting the AVAs of Napa Valley, working to protect and enhance the region. So you can't really use the word Napa on something else. It's, it's legally protected as a word and as a term. And overall, creating and fostering a sense of collaboration and community within the wine community. So whether you are on the road or at, or at home, members of the Napa Valley Vintners are working together to promote Napa Valley through a variety of programs that they do inbound within their own home country, but also in the international markets, including organizing a lot of charitable, benevolent sort of activities that promote the Napa Valley as a whole. This uh, picture you see is landscape of the valley. And the second category of NVV's work also involves to protect the Napa Valley, its name, its industry, its land, its people, all of that. And so, you know, it's great. And lastly, about fostering collaboration, which I have already talked about. I'm really, really very excited that uh, we are collaborating with Napa Valley Vintners on this wonderful seminar today, where we are sharing with you all this educational information about Napa Valley as a region. Uh, and I thank Napa Valley Vintners for having given us this opportunity to not just share a little bit about Napa Valley with you or give you a glimpse into Napa Valley, but also what is about to follow is, um, is a wonderful chat we're going to have with three incredibly iconic wine producers of Napa Valley who will give us their direct insights into, into their history and all of that. But before that, I want to summarize this presentation through the top five takeaways. Napa Valley is an extraordinary place, a place that makes wines that are unique and unlike any other in the world uh, in terms of prestige and, and quality and recognition they sit right at the top of the pyramid of the world of wines so there is no denying that and all of this is enabled of course through a lot of attention to detail lots of quality winemaking but also through a massive culture of collaboration a sense of community a sense of pride uh, napa valley is a thriving industry we've seen that even through some of the recent odds that they have been through, whatever adversities that climate change and all other things are thrown at them, they seem to emerge even stronger, better, and more and more amazing. So our respect for Napa Valley continues to go up. And I think the demand for Napa Valley continues to go up. Uh, I know there isn't enough Napa Valley in India that I can say with, with, with a great deal of certainty. Um, and uh, uh, congratulations to the NBV and all the winemakers of Napa Valley that have created a history and a legacy of cultivating extreme excellence. Um, and I guess with that, I would like to urge you all to dis visit the NapaVintners.com website or also follow them on these social media handles where you can continue to learn more about Napa Valley, its AVAs, its terroir, its climate, soils, winemaking, and its people, most importantly. Um, thank you, guys. Thank you for listening. But don't go just yet, because what we have following right up, just after I've had a sip of this water,
Hello, and we are back. As I promised, we are here with three incredibly iconic uh, vintners of Napa Valley who are here to share with us lots of stories about Napa Valley, their personal journeys, and of course, all the wonderful things that Napa Valley represents seen through their eyes. I can't wait to introduce you. We have three stellar vintners in our midst. We have Rus Weiss, who's the president of Silverado Vineyards, Jean Charles Boisse, who's a proprietor of Boisse Collection. Hello, and we are back, as I promised. We are here with three incredibly iconic uh, and, uh, and Dan DiPolo, who's the yes. president of yes. Darius Vineyards. Welcome to all three of you, and thank you for making the time to join me today in this lively panel discussion. It's an honor to be with you. Thank you, Sonal. Thank you, George Charles. Okay, well, I'm, we just finished a presentation, actually, a 30-minute presentation where I gave everybody, all our viewers, a quick glimpse into what the Napa Valley stands for, you know, the climate, the soils, the terroir, the AVAs, uh, and what the NVV is doing as a body to uplift and enhance the, you know, and all the wonderful work that it's doing for the Napa Valley. But really, I want to know from all three of you, starting with Russ, Silverado is owned by the Walt Disney family. Uh, we'd like to understand from you, why did they move to Napa Valley and why did they found a winery here? What did they see in Napa Valley and why did they want to start a winery here rather than anywhere else, any other region in the world? Tell us about your history in the Napa Valley. Yeah, that's, um, <clears throat> I think that's a very familiar story for a lot of people because when you come over that rise, when you get over the Napa River and you turn the corner into the valley proper, the uh, the, the scenery, you you know, is just so beautiful and it's it's such a jewel box. It's this little tiny, beautiful jewel. And when um, uh, Diane Miller, uh, who, who's the daughter of, of, of Walt Disney, when she and her mother uh, first came to the valley in 1975 and rounded that corner, she said she was just it took her breath away. And so I think. Obviously, you know, in the 70s, uh, uh, you know, Californians were becoming very proud of, uh, you know, their culture and, and the things that they were they were doing that were on a on a world class level. And I think one of those was obviously uh, with the with the incredible work of the vintners starting in the 30s, but also with the, you know, with the coming of kind of the modern age and in, in uh, in in Napa with you know great figures like Robert Mondavi uh you know spreading the gospel as it were about Napa uh everybody uh everybody in California w became quite energized by our local uh, culture and our local style and I think uh you know wines kind of fit in 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 uh, culture and style and Diane was fascinated with it she had been taking uh, she and her husband, Ron, have been taking wine classes from a, a, a wine writer, Bob Balzer, who, who was writing for the LA Times at the time, and they had to go see Napa. And when they came around that corner, they were just, they were just absolutely uh, taken aback. And Diane said from that moment, she just had a dream of, of, of starting something in the Napa Valley. So they, they purchased their first vineyard, the Miller Ranch, which makes our Sauvignon Blanc, and, and it's where the family's home is. Uh, in 1976, and then in 1978, they they purchased the iconic Silverado Vineyard, uh, and later in 1981 started making wine uh, and borrowed that name, the Silverado Vineyard, for the winery. I love that name, but I'll come back to you on why the name and what what's the history of the of the name from. But Josh, Charles, you're up next. Your family originates from Burgundy. You're French vintner originally from a family of French vintners, and uh, you now live in Napa Valley. So, what did you see in California and Napa Valley, and why did you decide to make start making wines in Napa? And not to draw a direct point of comparison between Burgundy or Napa, but what is it about Napa that 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 kind of entices you uh, or makes you love it more than maybe even Burgundian wines? Well, so now, very similar to what Russ very eloquently has always said, and I know Dan will say as far as the Daryush story, and I would echo it to India. You know, certain countries, certain locations, you are magnetized by it. You know, your vortex of energy is attracted to it, and from your root to your third eye. And I use, obviously, the uh, chakras 
to bring the image of India that you know I adore. And this is why we have as well a joint venture in your beautiful country that I admire. Because Napa Valley and America at large has this energy that brings you in, that allows you to feel that local terroir, as we call it so well in Burgundy, and allows you to think that everything is possible. So I would go more on a tangent as well, Disney, who happens to be one of my favorite characters of all time as a creator. Everything is possible and dare to dream. And as Dariush would echo what I would say with Dan and, yeah. and Russ did, because I had the pleasure to meet Russ, my first visit to Napa Valley, and we had a marvelous lunch thanks to him. And I was looking when he was at Mondavi at the edge of this beautiful hillside, looking at the Vacas and Mayakamas, and I had a dream, very similar to the dream that we all have, where you feel this is here. This is the place. This is where I want to anchor as well, in addition to my historical background of Burgundy in Vougeot, where I want to anchor as well the continuation of our family. So I think it's a vortex of energy. It's the alignment of all the magnetic forces that brings you to a place, and then that helps you to radiate in a sense that everything comes together. And I think Napa Valley, finally, as you relate it to Burgundy, is the same size. When you think about yeah. the close to 50,000 acres of Napa, it's the same as Burgundy. Burgundy. The petitness, this beautiful cleavage where we sit in between Maikamas and Vacas allows us to have diversities of terroir, uniqueness, and a very manageable type of distance between each of us. So we together, and we all great neighbors, Russ, I could see him from where I am right now. I could see Dan where he is. I'm on Wapo Hill and they are really close neighbors. We're a mile apart and we feel each other. We bring each other's energy. You know, each of those wines that they produce are fabulous. And this friendship that camaraderie makes what Napa Valley so good. And the welcoming that Russ gave me over 16 years ago now, as well as Dan and Dariush and all of us, makes it so unique that Napa Valley is that place that is, again, very magnetic. Incredible. Thank you for that answer. That's, you know, just, and you make it so relate, <clears throat> excuse me, you make it so relatable when you use words like chakras and, and all of that. So magnificent. Thank you. Well, and so now I would just say one more thing, if you don't Please. mind. No, no. It's the same as when I met you many, many years ago. You have that magnetism, that energy that you drive and that inspiration that makes us be with you today and, and really makes us want to do things in your beautiful country because of what you attract, you represent, and you magnetize within us to want to bring Napa Valley and California at large to one of the best country on the planet, one of the most admired country on the planet, that is India. JC, thank you so much. You're always so kind with your praise, so generous. And I am fully aware, but our viewers should know how early in the morning it is in Napa Valley. It is quarter to eight in the morning. So I'm so grateful that you've all made the time. I know you all have an early start anyway, but this is particularly very early. Especially you know, we didn't go to bed. We were all partying last night together, having <laughs> wine, and we said, we might as well stay with the ego. Yeah, well, now I'm jealous. But 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 to make it worth your while, you should all, I should also let you know that we have over 5,000 viewers who are live listening to right. us right now. Yeah, that's yeah. the exact number Bravo. tells me. So that we've been able to do, um, yeah, we this has been a really successful summit for us. And, and this yeah. is the crescendo. This is the last session of this summit. Uh, and we've made sure we've built up all the momentum to get to the crescendo tonight. So thank you again for for, for all of you uh, for joining tonight. Um, Dan, I do want to know from you the same as because it's particularly so uh, so fascinating to know that Dariush uh, Kaledis was born and raised in Iran. So the history of Dariush where yeah. it started from, you know, as a relocation from Iran, moving yes. to the US as a young person. And then how did he find his way to the Napa Valley? It's almost like the American dream. So tell us about the history, your history in the valley. Yeah, no, very, very much so. And I'm glad that uh, Jean-Charles uh, spoke the way he did. 
you know, Dariush was born in Iran, and, and of course, Iran and, and India have so much history together uh, and so much influence and so much trading of uh, cultures and, and business even uh, several thousand years ago. Um, Dariush uh, was raised and, and, and ended up becoming a civil engineer in Iran. And while he um, likes engineering, he's a little bit more of an entrepreneur and he has great passion in the world. And he started a engineering company in the late 60s in Tehran, building roads and tunnels and while Iran was industrializing at that time. And he was quite successful, but, you know, I think he always had this very strong passion or desire for more freedom and more opportunity than was available in Iran in the mid 70s. So he emigrated in 1975 to Los Angeles. Uh, he did not speak English. He just had a, you know, an idea and a dream and a, a lot of passion in his heart uh, to become an American and to be a very successful entrepreneur. Um, he could not be a engineer in America because he didn't speak English and didn't have a license. So he ended up buying a small uh, grocery store in Los Angeles. And I'll skip forward, but 20 years later, he owns 44 supermarkets throughout California. Wow. He owns the largest family-owned grocery uh, uh, store in the state. And he found great success and great opportunity uh, by working hard and, and being clever and, and, and following his dream and not being discouraged, which is what we all should do in life. And so um, parallel to his you know, entrepreneurial success, uh, Darish has always been a, uh, a very enthusiastic collector of Bordeaux. And his dream um, was to own a property in Bordeaux. And when his grocery empire became successful enough that he could truly consider buying a property, he did a lot of research in uh, Bordeaux, but ultimately decided to come to Napa Valley. And I think what he was inspired, you know, clearly Napa and Bordeaux have a lot going for them. Um, and the differences are sometimes significant in terms of climate and wine style and things like that. But for Dariush in Napa Valley, he felt like he could come to an area that was still had things to prove, still had, you know, uh, uh, opportunities for for pioneers and, and, and new ideas and uh, independent thinkers like Dariush is naturally. And he came and purchased a property in southern Napa Valley, south of Stag's Leap. We're about two miles south of Russ. Uh, and, you know, the vineyard was planted to Chardonnay, which is a Burgundian grape. And Dariush replanted that to uh, Bordeaux varieties because he was such a Bordeaux fan. And since that time, uh, over the last 15 years that I've worked for Dariush, we've acquired uh, four different vineyards throughout Southern Napa Valley, um, Oak Knoll Appalachian, uh, Coombsville Appalachian. And then we're, our wines are highly influenced by Mount Veeder as well. And right. so, you know, we have our own uh, vision for what we're looking for in our wines. Um, we appreciate style. Uh, I hope that your, your uh, uh, listeners are, have seen Dariush on the website and look at his story because I think they will find a lot in common with his passion and his uh, desire and his love of wine. So that's a good start. That's a great start. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And I'm particularly inspired by this, uh, you know, wanting to Bordeaux and then ending up with Napa instead and then making such a, such a great success story, uh, you know, out of it. Um, I do want to touch upon something that I get to hear a lot as a professional, but uh, there's this whole opinion, a general opinion in the in, among wine enthusiasts or travelers, or I would say mostly consumers, who tend to feel that all of Napa Valley cabs, Cabernet Sauvignons, are the same. You know, it, they kind of tend to be stylistically similar. Personally, for me, when I was in Napa Valley two years ago and we tasted a lot of them, yes, you tend to get some sort of a commonality, but increasingly, I find that Cabernet Sauvignons of Napa Valley are changing, they're evolving, they're, they're kind of also getting more elegant. They're, I mean, not to say they weren't earlier, don't get me wrong, but there, there is a conscious effort 
to change the style to make them lighter, maybe more. I just want to know your comments, and anybody can take this question. Maybe uh, um, you know, maybe maybe Dan or or Jason. Actually, actually, any of you three could take that. Yeah. But what are your comments about the style of Cabernet Sauvignon of Napa Valley being what it is, and what inspires the style to be what it is? And is it undergoing a change, and for what reason, if so? Well, speaking speaking for Daryush, you know, and I won't speak for for Napa in general, but you know, Daryush is a man of great style and great individuality, uh, as is Russ and and Jean Charles. But for Daryush, he's always wanted to take his own path, sort of the path less less you know taken, so to speak. Um, and for him, you know. Crafting wines that have a style that is very unique, that is gracious, that has a seamlessness. Uh, for us, we I'm not critical uh, at, in any way of the style of wines coming out of Napa for the last 50 or 70 years. But we have found or we have pursued a strategy by which we're acquiring vineyards that we think are going to add a very unique and distinctive style. I would say that Dariush um, has a lot of European style in his tastes. He obviously has a gigantic portfolio of Bordeaux in his cellar. Um, so we are looking for what I would call a seamlessness, a graciousness, um, you know, but it's a personal choice on whether you like more fruit or less fruit. Uh, Napa has a great opportunity to make very complex wines and what you choose to feature or highlight is really up to the um the property so yes for us we we try to bring a little bit more grace into our wines or more complexity rather than just ripeness um but but that's where that this is where napa is uh uh and from a climactic standpoint yes and so now Josh, what about you maybe you want to share a little bit about the magic of rutherford mm -hmm. with our viewers y yes uh, and and I'm so glad you're asking these questions because I really believe when we look at the history of the last 40 years in Napa Valley, we see maybe three tranches, three different sequence of style. And, you know, coming obviously from Burgundy myself and having had the experience of Pinot Noir specifically, I was always looking for eloquence, finesse and refinement. So today, as we own Raymond Vineyards, that is a really vibrant, you know, winery in Rutherford and Santa Lina, as well as Buena Vista winery, very anchored as well in Rutherford, Santa Lina, as well as Yonville. We really have decided to take a stand over the last 11 years of finesse with power. So we really moved away dramatically from the high alcohol level, high ripeness and high tannic structure. We want integration. The obvious word is always balance, but balance with power, because the power underlies into the soil of Napa Valley in America. So you're not trying to make a right bank or even a left bank. You're making a Napa Valley wine. And for us, you know, fortunately, we have over 30 wineries in our collection. Each of them needs to have a purpose, a raison d'être, a reason to exist. And that reason to exist is to be able to stand on its own. And I think Napa Valley, luckily today, has created itself such a name, but besides a name, a style that speaks volume, that speaks with the energy of that local flavor, that is Napa. So I don't think we ever need to need to try to emulate Bordeaux Anybody, or yeah. the Russian River Burgundy. We need to be our own identity, which is for us, from Rutherford to Santa Lina to Stag's Leap to Oakville, and as well, very much so Yonville, to attempt to be refined, eloquent, balanced, but with lingering velvety power that you would not necessarily find in a Bordeaux. So I would like to add, as the Frenchman here on the group, maybe an additional je ne sais quoi to Napa Valley that the people in Bordeaux maybe don't have. And I would recommend all our listeners and all our friends to not compare anymore Napa Valley to Bordeaux. It's its own personality, its own level, and in many ways, much higher pedigree. 
So I know I'm going to have a hard time when I fly back to France and people hear what I just said, but I really would insist on that. Napa Valley could be in many instances, much more charismatic with a greater identity and much more, you know, force within its roots all the way to its ethereal, compassionate statement than Bordeaux can. So go Napa Valley. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you. Um, I agree with you. I, but, you know, to be fair, I think when, when I think about the Indian audiences, and I hope I'm right when I say this and I speak on behalf of everybody, but I think to a lot of Indians, especially who enjoy good wine, good life, uh, I think for us, Napa Valley anyway is very distinctive. I think we enjoy a very close nexus with the with California anyway, because we we travel a lot to the U.S. We enjoy our holidays in the U.S. We travel a lot to San Francisco. If for nothing, we come for the shopping. Oh, our children study at universities in California and across the Americas. So a lot of for our, for a lot of us Indians, our second homes are also based in the U.S. So invariably, because we tend to come a lot to California, a lot to San Francisco, sort of, you know, a lot of us Indians end up visiting Napa Valley, discovering Napa Valley, the taste of Napa Valley. And I think we all have, I get more of why isn't there more Napa Valley available in India all the time, more than this is like that or this is not like that. You know, I don't think Indians uh, Indians as a, as a market is trying to draw that comparison. I do have some questions on that, but Russ, I would like you to tell us, Russ, what you feel about uh, the style of the Silverado uh, vineyard wines, uh, the Cabernet Sauvignon in particular or any other wine that you please. What, what's yeah, I think, yeah. Uh, well, first of all, I want to make the remark, Jean Charles, are, are you the best or what? I, it's unbelievable. It's why you ask, you know, if you need a crescendo, it's why you ask Jean Charles to join us because he's, uh -huh. he, he is the, he is crescendo personified. Uh -huh. Thank yeah. you. Thank yeah, you, Russ. Awesome. <laughs> Love it. Great to see you, by the way. Uh, anyway, uh, listen, you know, Jean Charles mentioned uh, uh, a thing, and I, I want to take a thing that Dan mentioned and, and, and that John Charles mentioned and kind of put them together because historically, I think, you know, you were, you were about to say, Jean Charles, that, that there were uh, some phases of Napa Valley in terms of winemaking. And I was privileged enough to work for uh, Brother Timothy at the Christian Brothers, uh, I, I don't know, sometime after the French Revolution. That's how I, old I am. And, uh, and, you and kept we, your were head up, <laughs> we were obsessed with making sure that we didn't have any faults in the wine. Do you know, we were a young, a, a young valley and we were, we were worried about making wines that were clean and perfect. And so I think in, in, you, if you think of those wines in the 70s and, and into the early 80s, uh, we were really, really trying to make sure everything was really good. Uh, not, not nuanced necessarily, but just didn't, without any faults. Oh, okay. And I think over time, then, then we've relaxed a little bit. We've, we, we, we've, we've kind of relaxed into where we are and who we are. And then what you see is these explorations like, like Dan said of, st of individual style. And we have a tremendous amount of folks who, who are exploring individual styles, which is really changing who we are as Napa Valley. And then I think in terms of, you know, the family that I work for, we've relaxed into individual sites. So we are making wines at, at the vineyard level and the block level. And in terms of, of uh, Silverado, maybe because of a historic accident, we're making wines at the clone level. In other words, we have a selection Massal on our site of Cabernet that's totally unique in the world that was created starting in the 1960s and over a 30 year period became its own unique Cabernet that UC Davis recognized as a heritage clone we're one of three in the Valley, but there are more folks doing massal selections now than ever before, because we understand now that a vine can adapt to its individual site. And, and, and of course, we're, we're very proud to have an individual historic one that's, that's recognized in the, in the vine catalog. And we make solo from that as an expression of a single clone. But I think it's rather than talk about what that means to Silverado, I, I just want to highlight what that means for the Napa Valley, that folks are really digging into the interaction over time of plant material on a site with human decision making that has, to, to John Charles' point, no reference to any other growing region. 
it's a the reference is to what we're doing absolutely in the moment uh in, in on, on these beautiful sites and i think one of the reasons there's so much camaraderie in the valley is that 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 exploration of whether you're high up on a mountain on the east or whether you're under the fog line in a foothill on the west side or whether you're by the river, wherever you are, because of the amazing diversity of climate and soil here, you are in, by definition, you are in a unique spot in the Napa Valley. Yes. And so we're Very not so worried. We're not so worried about like, oh, well, my wine tastes like Dan's wine or I, I, I'm totally untroubled by that. You know, we, yeah. we are obviously going to make super unique wines now. And I think we really that's the new phase that we're in is really going deeply into our individual sites. Yeah, I love this phase and I love how you put it. And I love the idea of how from the 80s, when you're all you were trying to create is fall free wines, there came a, there, there came a phase of just effortlessness set in. And, you know, this this innate confidence that just kind of comes and the confidence operates at two levels. Once the grape variety or the vine plant itself gets confident on its own soil. And then the person making the wine also kind of has a sense of ease and effortlessness about, you know, driving that passion and how the both come together to create something extraordinary. I love how you sort of yeah. describe that process. I mean, uh, there's a hell of a lot of other regions I can think of right now in the world who need to reach that, that point of uh, inflection. Um, but it's 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 a wonderful story. Uh, there was a lot about Cabernet Sauvignon we just spoke about. But if I were to ask each one of you, because there's so much diversity of styles, grape varieties coming out of Napa Valley today. So if Cabernet Sauvignon is the king of Napa Valley, if at all it is for you, then who's the queen for each one of you and why? What is the second grape variety after Napa Valley? Uh, or, or, or rather, uh, after Cabernet Sauvignon that thrills you or excites you or you feel um, really like sort of charged about? Wow. Well, I'll start if you want. Uh, I, I was just going to say, let me, let me transition from, from Russ talking about different decades. I, I want every one of your viewers to realize that, you know, winemaking is a lifetime pursuit. Uh, and, you know, Nap has been at it for over 100 years easily, but really the last 40 years, we've really come into the international scene. Um, and the, th the reason why things take so long is that, you know, vines age and change, and it takes time to experiment with different clones on different sites, you know, and it's all about the pursuit of making better and better wines. And sometimes that takes a decade of experimentation, sometimes you realize that that particular clone is not going to work. And so you try something different or you try a, a new uh, a variety and you have to wait another 10 years for that vine to mature to really see what uh, the, the wine tastes like. So this is a very slow process um, and it takes a lifetime of, of dedication to, 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 to really find uh, uh, who you are as a person and what your, what your vineyards can stand for. And, you know, Dariush is now 22 years old and in our pursuit uh, of experimentation and of acquiring vineyards in many different diverse uh, sub appellations in Napa, you know, we've really become quite well known for some of these, I'll call them, I don't know if they, we call them the, the queen variety, but, but alternative varieties that are a little less well known or a little less praised like Cabernet Franc, um, or I'll even add to Merlot on its own. Um, and for us, you know, Dariush being a, a, a Persian and having grown up in Shiraz, Iran, we have a we have a magnificent uh, uh, Shiraz or Syrah that we grow on our estate about a mile west of where I'm at right now in Oak Knoll. And on that on that uh, uh, vineyard, we also have a great Viognier, which is another Rhone uh, uh, clone. So. I can't say from all of those that, you know, this one's better than another, but, but the winery it, it, over the last 20 years has really become known for Cabernet Sauvignon with a particular, um, you know, uh, 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 reputation for Viognier, Syrah, Cabernet Franc, some of these more unusual varieties. Okay. Well, I was going to say, I'm, I'm going to let you name all your babies, but then you have to choose a baby, but... But uh, I would probably I would probably choose uh, uh, Viognier or Shiraz, 
simply because Shiraz has this sort of cultural history for Dariush. If, yes. if he was here, um, that's what he would be talking about. But uh, it's tough to pick sometimes. You know, yeah. I, there's a lot of exciting things that now that we're in our, our, our third decade, we're just now getting to the point where we've really fine tuned our wine style. And there's there's a lot to be uh, said and discovered with Dariush. Yeah, sure, sure. JC, what are the different grape varieties and styles that that uh, <laughs> wine lovers can enjoy from Raymond? Or yes, or, or Buena Vista. I would, I would probably echo, obviously, Dan, very articulate answer on the grape specifics. I won't go to the specifics of the grape. I'm going to stay on the style front. And I believe uh, the art of blending is what really makes a wine region unique. And the antithesis, obviously, of Burgundy, where you speak vineyard-specific, row-specific. So what I'm a big admirer of Napa Valley is the alchemy of the grapes. Whether we assemble Petit Verdot, Cabernet Franc, as Dan, you said, which is obviously a phenomenal evolution and one of my favorite. We've seen a lot of great varieties disappear in Bordeaux for all the climate change we know have occurred. Petit Verdot is one, Malbec is another, and many others. I think we will see the same over time in Napa Valley. I think the key, and we've done that with Buena Vista on a proprietary blend that was created by the Count of Buena Vista in 1861 in Napa Valley with Charles Krug. So you're talking about over 155 years ago now, at the time when Napa Valley got started. Yeah. And I really believe we're going back to this so now, as you and I are passionate about history and really passionate about going back in time and time coming back at the right time. Sure. And I think we need to give time, time for Napa Valley to blossom and really create wines that are not just varietal specific. I think we went through that phase, which is good. And Cabernet obviously was a great place yeah. to identify ourselves as a niche. But as we all will compose, and Russ will tell us about some amazing varieties that he grows on his hill, is the fact that the alchemy of the blend, the art of composition, makes it very specific. And as you know, so now we're doing it at Jenoon with our very good friend, you know, Baro. Sekri in Maharashtra. And with Jenoon, this is a composition of six great varieties. We want to sell Jenoon from India, not just Cabernet Sauvignon. So my big suggestion is to be open-minded to the art of blending that brings that style that I've described before. And it could be Cabernet, it could be Petit Verdot one year, it could be maybe more with Cabernet Sauvignon with a growing interest again for Merlot. Merlot is very seductive in Napa Valley, it's very refined, brings that level of finesse nice. and lace in a blend that is, you know, the beautiful charm, Sonal as I look at your beautiful eyes, I'm transported to the world of India. I'm imagining a beautiful dance with you. And this is what Merlot does to the blend. So I would give it a chance to go on proprietary blend, on any blend that Napa Valley speaks, because a blend allows you, like Dan, you mentioned, you know, you talked about Shiraz and 6,800 years ago, your style. Of you know, which is seven to nine great varieties. The mm -hmm. alchemy of the blend allows you consistency, reliability, and obviously a style that you can establish over time. So, Sonal, are we dancing? Yes, I was just going to say, let's stop imagining about the dancing and let's just make it happen. I wish I wish international travel would just open up. But, Russ, yeah. unless you wanted to take the same question, I did want to ask, because uh, Jean Charles is obviously already a collaborator for the Indian market, and I'm more interested in knowing uh, from you and Dan about... Uh, what is it that you, how do you see the Indian market? We did a wonderful seminar last week on uh, the Indian wine market. I don't know whether you were part of it, but I sort of spent some time uh, sort of sharing some, some information about the Indian market. But generally, what's your, what's your vision? What's your understanding? And more than that, what's your expectation from the Indian market? How do you see the Indian market at all? From you and Dan, please. Yeah, let me... Uh... Uh, let, let me go backwards before I go forwards, because uh, I, I think the 
the if you think about Silverado and how excited we are about Cab Franc, yes. Dan mentioned it, John Charles mentioned it. John, John Charles started. John Charles mentioned Marlowe, I think. Yeah, uh, we 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 do all that, but we're absolutely enamored of our. So maybe it's our our maybe the you know the the queen of Napa Valley, as you said, but enamored of our Mount George Vineyard, which was first planted to Cabernet Franc and Cabernet in 1868. So, you know, Jean-Charles, you mentioned pedigree and you mentioned energy. And I, I, I think those come together in that kind of a scenario. Uh, I love the energy in the wine of Cab Franc. It has this tremendous purity and wow. energy. And I think that's, that's mm -hmm. great. But I just, wanted, I, just wanted to, I just wanted to say that Napa isn't always all about that. So I just wanted to throw everybody listening a little bit of a curveball. You asked for the king... I may be giving you the court jester because uh, I was up pretty early this morning. We're, we're getting ready to bottle. Uh, and so I was actually tasting wine a little bit before I, I came on here. And it was uh, actually Kerner. So we've actually planted that little offshoot of, of Riesling that's in, in the, the Sud Tyrol uh, up on our Soda Canyon property and now are making a <clears throat> delicious spicy white wine called Kerner. Uh, here in the Napa Valley. And I don't think that, I think you have to really relax into a site and relax into your style uh, when you when you plant something that has never before been planted in Napa. And I don't yeah. mean to say that as a Silverado thing. I just mean, to, we're not unique. I, I run across so many of my friends now who are experimenting with so many wonderful different varieties, you know, Sauvignon Vert and, 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 and the resurgence of Chenin Blanc. And, and so it's not just about Cabernet, it's not just about red, it's also about white wines, and it's also about this tremendous variety that's that's happening that is so exciting right now in the Napa Valley. I'm so glad, I'm so excited you shared about Cabernet Franc. I must admit, I, I'm to blame. I've never really personally paid attention to Cabernet Francs from Napa Valley, but I will do going forward. I will yeah, you should. You pay more attention. It's incredible. But, and it's so incredible that all three of you mentioned a different way to sort of look at the whole thing or, or approach that question. Um, any, I'm just conscious of the time, and I know Connor said to me you should not go over 40 minutes, but I do want to know um, about what your expectation is from the Indian market and why. what about in, being an Indian market excites you? And then I'll share with you a little bit about what we're doing with your Shah's wines in India. Yeah. Well, I well, I mean, first of all, you know, for Silverado, we've we've always been the the sneak attack, you know, on the Indian market. We we've sold through our our agency in Singapore to the duty-free market in India and, and quite successfully over time. Um you know, uh, I loved how you commented that India is just so much like the United States in so many ways, because each you know, each state has its own rules and its own approach to alcohol and its own regulatory environment, its own tax environment. And it's, you know, it is a, an amazingly complex uh, market to operate in. And I think often folks look at that and they and, and they look at it very much, you know, if you're importing into the United States, it's very similar, like who, who you need partners and, and maybe you need more than one. And, and it's it's such a vast market. What I what I love about it is it's it's demographic and limitless potential. I mean, it feels like, you know, Jean-Charles mentioned that about sort of the limitless potential of making wine here on the Western edge of the continent. Uh, I, I really feel like the market in India has this limitless potential, um, not, not for all the regular sort of marketing reasons, but because, because every culture has its own approach to what is delicious. And, and so every, every synergy between what we do crafting what we think is delicious will have an interesting combination with what indian consumers will think is delicious and i really don't have an expectation about that i'm just excited by it i'm excited by uh, all of those combinations occurring we're so small right now as napa in india but i think that the potential is just uh, awesome and and the potential for having a really delicious journey together is awesome Incredible. Thank you. Yeah. That's a yeah. very exciting answer. Dan, how about you? Well, you know, it's very simple for for uh, for Dariush. We're, we're a very small winery. Um, we sell most of our wines here at the winery in Napa Valley. Uh, I, I 
our, our goal is simply to find passionate wine collectors, great restaurants, sommeliers that are looking for, uh, you know, smaller wineries that are making specialty wines uh, that have a, a singular voice that are exceptionally well made. And so, you know, I oversee our international sales uh, and we're in about 15 countries. Uh, this, these are smaller volumes, but from, uh, you know, Tokyo to Toronto, to the UK, to Singapore, uh, to Sweden, uh, we've, we've found some great partners um, that are interested in having a, a small amount of Dariush for their collectors. Um, so I, you know, I, we are not currently in, in India. I am looking for an importer. I'm looking for a small importer with, you know, uh, uh, that would fit our, our, our needs. Uh, this is not about scale for us. This is about finding passionate wine collectors that, that, that will appreciate not only our Cabernet Sauvignon, but wines like our Viognier and Shiraz, which I think would go great with Indian cuisine. Um, and I look forward to traveling there someday to make the presentation. So we'll oh, see. Such a mm -hmm. great heartfelt connection you just made. Thank yeah. you for sharing that with us. Yeah. Josh Charles, my prediction is that in the next five years, you will be prime minister of India. Um, <laughs> but in the in, but in the interim, what are you going to do in India? Will you tell or which should I? Well, you should say it. Uh, I'm you know, I'm obviously bullish, and I will put it to the Indian people. Very importantly, the Indian culture, from its diversity of color, sense, senses, and attitude and beliefs, is living a philosophy of life that welcome any flavor, that welcome absolutely anything from around the world with a smile. Therefore, I believe the wine world hasn't yet started, but is doomed to boom in the future because people have the understanding of taste and flavor and have the understanding of this incredible diversity that you speak so well because everybody should go on Sonal Instagrams and WhatsApp and Facebook, probably one of the best in the world of wine. And you speak about it so well in such a great way that I'm enamored every time I go to India, as you know, it could be north, south, east or west. I'm in love with the country, more importantly, in love with the people. And the people have a very, very strong understanding of flavor. So I'm bullish, whether it's fine wine, whether it's entry-level wine, whether it's sweet wine, rich wine, whatever it is, India will be prompt to enjoying wine with the great food it has. And very fortunately, this incredible diversity of food that welcome Rhone Grey Vardis, as Dan said, Napa Valley, as Russ said, Burgundy, as we can imagine, to the Loire Valley, to the Sancerre, to the German and Austrian Rieslings and Grüner Wettlinger. I think the spectrum is so wide that we are discovering Indian food, and I've never been so excited. So now, as we've done in your beautiful home with your family and your daughter, to many of our friends all across India, tastings where people as well are curious. And I think the key in any nation, as America has been over the last 50 years, India is a collection of very intelligent people, curious people who are daring to try, daring yeah. to experience, daring to go there to the frontier that they don't necessarily know to really gain an additional flavor. And that's why I'm excited about it because the moment someone has rusts and Dan and Dariush and yourself is open intellectually to welcome new taste and flavor, we have achieved the first step of discovery. And I think the openness yeah. of what Indian people are to embrace others with a smile, with that beautiful smile that really characterize India with those beautiful colors and that peacefulness of mind, is welcoming the wine world. So I'm absolutely bullish. And now it's all you, Sonal, to tell everybody what we're doing. Well, well, firstly, I want to say, how can that not open anybody's, all of their chakras? I mean, yes. not anybody, how can anybody resist that charm? Thank you. Thank you for those wonderful words. 
uh, about India, about me. Uh, wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm humbled. Uh, well, I just couldn't resist. I, I couldn't resist. I had to, uh, you know, jump into my, you know, put on an extra hat and start becoming an importer. I couldn't resist importing. So I recently uh, started importing Buena Vista wines, part of the Boise collection. Yay! And they're being, they're being cleared even as I speak. And uh, yeah, well, Raymond's still up for takes, but I think I might block that too. I might block anybody else from you coming. might as well. <laughs> But uh, but thank you. But I'm very excited. I'm excited because this is my first wine that I'm going to start importing in India. But I think India is a is an exciting market, as Dan correctly said. Uh, uh, you know, Russ is equally excited. This is a, this is a market which has which is growing. It's still nascent, but there's a lot of very discerning um, people who are really curious and passionate about good wine. Uh, and for those few that are really seeking good excellence, quality, high quality, I think I can think of no better fit than, than Napa Valley. So any importer who is looking to build a direct to consumer sort of a connection or has the ability to create a, a, a very exciting sort of a dialogue directly with consumers, some of any of your wineries would be an excellent, excellent fit for any of such you know, sort of partners in India. And uh, you've, you've shared such wonderful stories with us today. I can't thank you enough. Um, Russ, you've been very, uh, uh, I think you've been very, um, uh, well, I don't know what the word is, but you said it took 40 years uh, to sort of make all this transformation and it's been so slow. Uh, I think you're being very harsh, actually, because I think 40 years is very less time. And if you see the, the journey that Napa Valley has made from where it was to where it is today, my God, what a transformation it's been. I mean, if if some other regions around the world in 40 years could be where Napa Valley is today, that what a, what a success story. So my hearty congratulations. And, you know, I talked earlier in the presentation about community and collaboration and camaraderie, but I may as well have left it for this presentation because it was so evident between all three of you. It's just live there for all of India right now to see. So my... You know, it's it, I, my heartfelt congratulations and uh, and best wishes to all three of you, as well as Napa Valley Vintners for this stellar opportunity and all the rest of the members who are going to be part of Hop Wine, the festival that plays out from Monday to Friday next week, where we hopefully facilitate a lot of introductions between uh, all the iconic Napa Valley wineries and potential importers in India. So uh, I remain excited. So thank you so That's much great. for tonight and thank you for this. And so now thank you to you. Thank you. Um, you know, as you know, Russ paved the way many years and has done an amazing, amazing job. Russ, thank you for all what you do always beyond Silverado for Napa Valley at large, as well as you, Dan. Very okay. impressive. And so now there's no one better than you as a prime minister. Uh, there's yes. no one more charming and a oh. prime minister who toast with the guest, as you know, um, Fred Ryan just finished a book on the white house. And I'm pleased to tell you though, that your prime minister is, uh, enjoying some of the genuine wines at the white house and has before. So the good news is you already have a prime minister who enjoys wine. So if you become the next prime minister, which I will vote for you, as you know, I have a, a voting right in India. If I become the prime minister, then God save in mm -hmm. India, because then we're going to have zero tax on wine for sure, right? Yeah. Everything's going to just That's right. the free market. So, but I, on that very optimistic note, um, thank you so much tonight. Thank you so much, guys. So, no, you're terrific. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I'll really see you next time. All right. We'll see you soon. Yes, thank you. No doubt. Excellent. Thank you.
For the part-time bonsai artist, who's a full-time investment banker, here's a piece of art that happens to be a decanter. Introducing the hosting collection by Shazay. Shine by design.